right, I'll call the order of the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of Wednesday, um, December 20th, 2023. We have a few agenda items today. We have the Brattleboro Retreat Fiscal Year 24 budget, which will be presented um, by the folks from Brattleboro Retreat together with um, Jeff Batista and Russ McCracken, and we have a potential vote noticed. Uh, at around 2.30, we'll have the Medicare... I'm sorry. Around 2.30, we'll have the Medicare benchmark proposal and a potential vote. And then around 3 o'clock, we'll start um, a presentation on the One Care Vermont Fiscal Year 24 budget. I'll turn to Susan Barrett for the Executive Director's Report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a brief one today. First, happy holidays to everyone and to the board. Um, with that in mind, we will not have a board meeting next week. So we look forward to seeing you in 2024 and our schedule for January will be posted shortly. Um, just a couple of ongoing public comment periods as folks may have um, known, we finished up our community engagement work for 67 around hospital sustainability in the fall. Um, we're continuing to take public comments and those comments are posted on our website. Um, that work will continue with some visits by our consultant in person in the spring. So um, information can be found on that work on our website. In addition, we have an ongoing public comment regarding uh, a next potential all payer model with the federal government. We take any of the comments we receive and share them with the Agency of Human Services as they are leading the current model as well as the negotiations for any potential next model. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, we have minutes from December 13th, 2023. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And the minutes from December 13th are approved. Um, I'll turn it over to um, uh, Mr. Batista, should I turn it to you or directly to the Brattleboro folks? Yeah, um, Brattleboro, Brattleboro will be uh, presenting first, so let's turn it over to them. Great, thanks. Um, Ms. Rossi, thank you for being here. That You're the chief executive. If you would mind introducing everybody and then we'll we'll hear your presentation and thank you for coming today. Ms. Rossi here. Uh, I've received an email saying they are uh, setting up the passcode now. Great, okay. Um, it occurs to me that um, since this is a, you know, a hospital budget hearing, um, I should also swear the witnesses in. Great. I guess for the Brattleboro folks, when you're all here, just let us know and Mr. McCracken can, can swear you in and then you can turn to your presentation.
And Chair Foster, this is Susan. There is a court reporter with us today. Her name is Claudine Foyer. Foyer. Um, knowledge. Thank you. Susan, while we wait, do you have any holiday songs you want to share? Oh, oh God, no, you would not want to hear me sing. But thank you for asking. Go for it, Owen. I bet you have one for us. I do have a guitar sitting next to me. <laughs> I'll spare you all. <laughs> Okay, um, Chair Foster, I have another message. Um, it said that the retreat is having a hard time signing on. There seems to be a problem with the computer blocking them from signing in. So do you, should, should we have Kristen and I maybe reach out to them to help them? And what would you like to do? Why don't we take a 12 minute break and just come back at 120 so they have sufficient time. And um, Kristen and Susan, I think there'd been a problem historically once with like whether you're logging through an Apple or something, I believe it was. Uh, so Mac, maybe that's yeah, the issue. Exactly. Okay, yeah. yeah. We'll see. Maybe they have some kind of a firewall at their um, institution. So let's, okay. um, Kristen and I we'll, will work on it. All right. We'll adjourn to 120. If we need more time, just send me a message. Thank, All you. Right, thank you. We can resume um, and I'll turn to Mr. McCracken to swear in the folks from Battle Brattleboro Retreat. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the Brattleboro Retreat uh, <clears throat> team. If you're going to be testifying or answering questions today, if you could raise your right hands and I'll swear you in. Uh, do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you, God. Thank you. Right. Thanks very much. And uh, we will turn it over to you. Good afternoon. I'm Linda Rossi here in the middle. I want to apologize for those uh, the technical difficulties at the beginning of the presentation. Thank you for your patience. Um, I am the CEO of the Brattleboro Retreat, and I have a number of the executive team here with me today uh, to participate in this budget review. Uh, before I begin, I, I would like to thank the Green Mountain Kia Board for including us in this process. Although we deal with a variety of uh, state entities, this is our first time with the Green Mountain Kia Board. Um, I want to acknowledge the support and guidance that we've received from the staff. It's been very helpful. Uh, we've learned a lot over the past couple of months in particular and have made some adjustments on our end uh, to be a better organization. So thank you um, to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, with me today um, to my right uh, is Jill Meschke. Uh, Jill is the Chief Financial Officer. On the other side uh, is Elizabeth Wall. She is a member of the executive team and in-house counsel. Um, on my left, which may be your right, I'm not sure how this 
uh, looks. I have Dr. Uh, Kyle Jeffries, our Chief Medical Officer, and on the other side um, is Amelia Schillingford, our Chief Nursing Officer. Um, I'm going to begin um, our presentation um, and I'll introducing Tom Eubner. Tom is joining us by Zoom. I think many of you know Tom. Uh, due to Tom's recent surgery, he has asked that I read his opening statement. So I'm on Tom's behalf. Uh, this is Tom speaking. I joined the retreat board in 2018 because as a retired CEO, I know how vital the retreat is to the functioning of the healthcare system in Vermont. The retreat provides all of the acute child and adolescent psychiatric beds in the state and about 50% of the adult beds. The retreat was hit particularly hard by the COVID pandemic. The rules for isolating patients in a psychiatric setting are particularly challenging. Staffing, which has always been difficult in mental health, has be became extraordinarily difficult. By March of 2022, the retreat census had dropped to 45 beds. This led to many problems throughout the entire health system in Vermont. Notably, it significantly contributed to the backup of psychiatric patients in the emergency room statewide. It was at that time that we worked with the Agency of Human Services to create a way forward and to turn things around. The retreat changed leadership. It committed to getting the census back to 100. The retreat created and improved a statewide transportation option for mental health patients. In turn, AHS provided the funding needed to help us accomplish these tasks. Very clearly, the retreat could not have accomplished its goals without AHS support. And most importantly, we could not have done it without the hard work of the entire staff of the retreat. The retreat is once again meeting the acute psychiatric needs of Vermont patients and looks forward to doing so in the years ahead. Okay, so I am going to uh, talk about um, where we've gone over the past couple of years and give an update on our current operations. So we began um, our turnaround and our baseline for this um, purpose is 2022. In January 2022, uh, the Brattleboro Retreat was an organization in crisis. Um, we had just concluded 2021 with a loss of $20 million, which was significant for the retreat. Um, in partnership with AHS, Secretary Samuelson, uh, Rich Donahue, we developed six sustainability strategies. Uh, the first was to create uh, increase in patient capacity. We needed to move from 45 open beds to 100 open beds. We needed to do that to be able to respond to the needs of the acute care hospitals and the people of Vermont, as well as to become financially viable. We needed to grow outpatient services. We needed new revenue streams. Um, we needed, and we need an EMR replacement, electronic medical record replacement. Uh, the current medical record system that we have, electronic medical record um, doesn't work and it has created issues for us for a long time, uh, but we didn't have the funds to be able to replace it. Um, we began a new APM, alternative payer model arrangement uh, with the state that I'll talk about a little bit uh, with regards to our Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, we looked to increase, we actually had a directive from AHS to enhance our payer mix. Uh, our commercial contracts needed attention. Some of them had been dormant uh, for quite a long time, and we uh, took a fresh look um, at those contracts. And we needed to improve revenue cycle management. Uh, the first thing we did there was to hire an expert consultant who we subsequently hired as our vice president of revenue management. Um, the APM contract was restructured, and that contract governs Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, that contract has a daily per diem that is capped. So, and I was Looking at some of our staffing this morning, where we're running, um, you know, each staff member might have two patients. Sometimes they have one patient, and that reflects the acuity of our current patient population. So, regardless of our staffing needs on a daily basis, we have a flat amount of money that does not change. So, we moved away from fee for service um, to this uh, model. 
Um, it also includes risk corridors on two points. We have a risk corridor on the number of level one, which are involuntary patients. Um, we have a no refusal rate um, that we need to abide by, and we also have utilization risk corridors, and that affects the amount of reimbursement we get. It's rather complicated, so I won't get into details, but um, those were two new parameters uh, that were uh, incorporated into the contract and are there to this to this date, and I think we're going into round four. Um, the 2024 uh, contract um, with the state for Medicaid is in the approval process, so we should have that done by the end of the year. Um, we had a directive from AHS to grow uh, capacity, and we had timelines, deadlines that were set. Um, we were asked to grow our capacity from 45 beds to 80 beds um, in a six month period of time, and we did that. Then we were asked to grow our 80 bed census to 100 um, within another six months, and we actually hit 100 within three months of that. That was the good news. The not so good news was that in order to do that, we had to hire contract labor uh, to double our capacity in that kind of time frame um, by the infusion of funds, which we received in, for some portion of time from AHS, um, but it allowed us to increase our capacity quickly. We've been holding steady at 120 to 130 uh, travelers since that time. Right now, our traveler contract population uh, comprises 50% of our direct patient care um, staff. Uh, the pandemic changed the labor market. It was already a strained labor market in terms of healthcare talent, uh, but after the pandemic, um, we saw major changes in terms of the talent pool. Uh, psych is generally about 10% of the healthcare workers um, and you know, we continue to see the impact of that. Telehealth changed a lot for us. Um, it changed in terms of provider um, talent. It changed in terms of social worker talent that was available. We also experienced wage pressures. We're on the Massachusetts border. Uh, that makes it very challenging for us uh, to be able to compete in the mass market. And we do draw uh, some of our staff from Massachusetts um, as well as New Hampshire. And uh, New Hampshire not having state tax presents its own challenges in terms of attracting individuals to work in Vermont. Um, we also have a housing shortage in Brattleboro, um, as many communities have. It was particularly challenging when you have 130 travelers that need a place to stay. Uh, so what the retreat did is we refitted and leased an empty nursing home uh, for three years. We had to get that approved by the housing authority um, and that has provided housing for our contract labor population, and we're hoping for an employee population as well. Uh, given the wait times in the EDs, we did our best at the retreat to provide relief, um, both to the patients that were waiting and to the acute care hospitals, um, to move those patients as quickly as we could into the right setting. Um, we improved our admissions process. We reduced our cycle times. We created a unique transportation solution and we worked hard to improve responsiveness and customer service. Um, transportation was a solution that we worked with OneCare to open access, um, and we contracted with Rescue Inc. and Ambulance Service on March 1st of 2022 to transport patients from any acute care hospital in the state of Vermont um, needing mental health care um, to the retreat. The retreat is funding that contract, 100% um, of that contract. We're hoping to renew the contract in 2023, um, and we're hoping to do so in partnership with UVM, uh, who will provide some funding uh, to expand transportation later into the evening and on the weekends. Again, this is available to all hospitals in the state. Um, I think it's worth uh, highlighting the fact that in early 22, uh, we had some leadership um, changes the CEO and the CMO. And a representative will be with you shortly. The CEO and the CMO both left the retreat in, in uh, early 2022. At that time, we did not have a chief financial officer. I was performing that role. We also did not have a chief information officer. I was trying to manage um, IT. In late 2022, 
um, our CNO and our director of quality left the retreat. So we had to rebuild the executive team. Uh, so I came on board um, in roughly April, May of 2022. Uh, Dr. Jeffries was there a month before myself. Jill, our CFO, joined the organization just this past May. Um, Amelia has been in the position for a year. Um, our CIO joined in the summer of this year. Uh, VP of Revenue Cycle Management joined um, about three about three quarters of a year ago, and we hired a new controller and a director of quality. So it's taken some time for this leadership team to become, you know, a team. And I think now we have all our key positions filled, um, and the team is is working in a very unified fashion and um, doing well. Uh, we also had a turnaround in labor relations. Anyone that has been following the retreat for some time knows that we were not in a good place with our union. Um, we spent um, a considerable amount of time and energy in 2021 to rebuild that relationship. We opened communications. We've been very transparent with the union. We have frequent communications. We meet every month uh, in labor management meetings. Um, as of today, we have no grievances and no arbitrations, and I can tell you that's a dramatic change from 2020 and 2019. Uh, we also renegotiated a three-year contract in June of 2022, which was several months early, and it was done very quickly. We have very constructive and productive relations with our union, I'm happy and proud to say. Um, the last item I just want to mention is the electronic medical record. Uh, this is an AHS, Agency of Health Human Services, sustainability deliverable. It was in our sustainability plan provided to them in January 2022. We have been working for the past year looking at various solutions and vendors, um, and we are currently evaluating the need to file um, for a CON uh, with the Green Mountain Care Board so we can um, hopefully move forward with that soon. So that is my overview of our operational status. I'm going to turn over to Jill Meshke, our CFO, uh, to talk about the financial turnaround. Good afternoon. I'm Jill Meshke, Chief Financial Officer at the Brattleboro Retreat, and I'll be providing a financial update. 2023 has been a turnaround year for the retreat financially. However, the recovery remains fragile. As of today, the retreat is experiencing 105 days cash on hand, but we project that to slightly decline throughout 2024. Banking relationships are positive. In 2023, the retreat was released from forbearance. We are in compliance with our covenants and both the liquidity ratio and the debt service cover ratio are well above the required targets. Like many other hospitals, labor costs are the primary financial challenge for the retreat. Year to date, 2023, labor costs have exceeded plan by 12%. Contract labor is plan to continue to drive expenses into 2024. Nursing leadership actively manages staffing daily to ensure the right staff are on the units at the right time and staff and management at the retreat do a very good job controlling other operating expenses. Administrative costs represent under 20% of the costs at the retreat. Despite growing hospital occupancy, the number of administrative staff has only increased slightly. This increase in capacity and flat administrative expenses has helped the retreat control overall costs of care. The retreat is an old institution with aging infrastructure. We make strategic capital investments focused on clinical units and spaces to improve buildings and care. More investment is planned in infrastructure for 2024. The retreat is investing in personal resources to bolster the financial acumen of the organization. There has been a turnover in some of the key financial roles, including that of the controller and the chief financial officer. Efforts continue to build a strong finance team. Within the last year, I was hired into the CFO role and Eric Bergen was hired as controller. Our additions in partnership with the experience of the other team members have stabilized the finance function. Additionally, Valerie Ostrander's hiring into the VP of Revenue Cycle has brought added leadership and knowledge to a hardworking revenue cycle and HIM team. She is leading key projects to improve revenue performance. Finally, thanks to the insights by the Healthcare Advocates Office, we have decided to make some immediate changes to our financial assistance policy. 
Effective January 1, we are expanding both eligibility for financial assistance and discounts being offered based on the federal poverty guidelines, and our policy updates will bring us into compliance with Act 119. Thank you. Thank you. I'll turn this over to Dr. Carl Jeffries, our Chief Medical Officer. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Dr. Carl Jeffries. I am the Chief Medical Officer at Brattleboro Retreat, and I'll be providing some information on uh, clinical care that's provided at Brattleboro Retreat, uh, which spans a broad range of levels of care. We provide outpatient level of care. We have partial hospital level of care. We have residential treatment options, and then we have inpatient hospitalization care. I'm going to start with the inpatient hospital. Um, volume data through uh, the, the year so far, 2023, um, is that we've been able to maintain an average daily census in the low 90s thus far. As Linda pointed out, we started the year with a capacity of 84. We were able to grow that capacity throughout the year. And one of the challenges with growing that capacity is that we also wanted to work very hard to maintain the, the capacity percentage that we had our, a census that was filling those beds. Um, that was very difficult along the way because in order to do that, we had to make uh, many facilities adjustments as well as staffing arrangements to accommodate that. So we've moved units around and along the way, we've had to make adjustments to, in order to maintain that capacity. Um, right now, we are at a capacity of a 99, but, and by the end of the year, we will be at a capacity of 101 beds. Um, the breakdown of those beds um, uh, following an adjustment last week that we were able to make in order to expand the number of adolescent inpatient beds um, is that we have a total of 68 beds out of those 101 that are adult beds. Currently, 26 of those beds are designated level one beds um, for uh, high acuity patients on one of our two high acuity units. And the remaining 42 beds are general adult beds. Um, 33 of those 101 beds are now uh, designated child and adolescent beds. The care will be provided on three different units. Two of those units will be adolescent units, and one of them will be um, designated as a child unit, providing care for patients 12 and under. Um, the adolescent units will be primarily 13 and above, though that 12 to 13 year age, uh, there's, there's some mix over sometimes. Um, in support of maintaining this high occupancy rate that we uh, that we were ever striving for, um, we needed to make some improvements in our admissions process. Uh, obstacles to admissions prior to uh, the, the work that we were doing were both in the efficiency and communication of our internal communication uh, admissions process, as well as communications with outside referral agencies. And so we made improvements in both of those. We looked at early communications with the outs outside referral agencies. Um, and so right now we have a process in place where we are uh, contacting those referral sources as early and as quickly as often uh, in order to ensure uh, a, a seamless admission process as, as much as able. Um, additionally, we brought in providers who were really accepting providers in the admissions process much earlier in the process than we had previously. So very early in the morning, uh, we have a provider who's involved and uh, communicating with outside hospitals and referral sources. Um, additionally, we, uh, as Linda noted, we wanted to pay attention to transportation issues because there were very often times that we had patients who were waiting in emergency rooms. We were ready to accept them, and there were transportation issues that were preventing that from happening. We entered into that contract with Rescue Inc., to which uh, uh, Linda previously referred. Uh, and as of 12, uh, as of December 11th, year to date, we've had 234 transfers that were able to take place to facilitate those admissions. Next year, we expect that to be higher because we've only had uh, uh, Rescue Inc. for uh, 10 out of the 12 months this year. Um, and. Uh, I'm happy to report that these changes did contribute to an improvement uh, overall. Um, this year, uh, nearly 70% of our admissions thus far have been uh, referrals that were made within the previous day uh, of the admission, um, which is uh, a, an improvement over previous years, and it is always our target to try to get somebody admitted within a 24-hour period after the referral process begins. Um, and anytime that you expand, uh, we are 
highly attentive to uh, quality issues along the way. We want to make sure that we are maintaining uh, quality of care when we are bringing in a, a large number of uh, new travelers um, and new staff and uh, expanding spaces and expanding programming. Um, early in 2023, we were able to hire a new director of quality. Um, at the same time, we were also able to hire a new patient safety officer. The two of those uh, uh, staff members were able to oversee and navigate a successful joint commission survey, which took place in May of 2023, um, with uh, recertification being granted at that point. And then since that time, we've had two impromptu licensing and protection CMS surveys that were uh, that came to us uh, following complaints or events that occurred. And both of those were wrapped up very quickly um, and both of those had no findings at the end of the survey. Um, in addition, we needed to make sure that we had appropriate staffing in place. And one of the tools that we do utilize here is telehealth um, to provide the care at all uh, levels of care, um, both the inpatient and outpatient. There are many advantages to this capability. This has helped with both recruitment and retainment um, and retention of our high quality core staff. Uh, it provides rapid access to providers in off hours. Whenever our patients need uh, a provider, we can get them quickly, uh, just getting the patient in front of the, the tele screen. And, uh, um, and, uh, and, and we, by, we built uh, tele units on every single one of our units. And by doing so, what we were able to do is provide access to that technology in a safe manner. So we have built-in technology um, that meets the safety standards of inpatient psych units. Um, currently, our general adult units um, have uh, core staff who are telehealth providers. So that has helped us with core staff, uh, providing core staff on those units. We don't have any telehealth core staff providers on uh, the adult intensive units or on the child or adolescent units. And then in the outpatient setting, we provide uh, telehealth uh, for individual psychotherapy, individual psychiatry visits, and our partial hospital is an entirely virtual uh, program um, with every bit of its care, both individual and group, uh, being provided by telehealth. And an additional advantage to this program is that it uh, increases access of care and widens our catchment area for patients who can uh, participate in that level of care. And then finally, I want to, uh, to just touch on the expansion of our outpatient care. We have, uh, in the past two years, been able to add two new specialty clinics to our outpatient uh, setting. First is transcranial magnetic stimulation, or our TMS clinic, and the second is our S-ketamine clinic. Both of these clinics are evidence-based treatments for patients diagnosed with treatment-resistant depression. They are, they are treatment protocols that are delivered over a defined period of time. And also both, both of them are procedure-based treatments. Um, and so the care is delivered to patients while they are in the office. Um, TMS is a non-invasive procedure where a device is placed on near the skull. It's used to deliver very brief magnetic pulses um, in a rapid succession over a defined period of time. And sometimes that period of time is as uh, quick as four minutes. Um, and then the defined treatment course is 30 uh, sessions delivered daily, Monday through Friday. Um, and then esketamine is a medication-based uh, treatment, and it is self-administered intranasally by the patients. And then it requires a two-hour monitoring, safety monitoring session afterwards, um, and that's performed in our clinics. Um, and the initial treatment course for that is eight-week time frame. Uh, with twice weekly sessions that then transitions gradually to one week. Um, and then there is the possibility for s to transition into maintenance therapies. And that's, uh, that's a broad overview of what we're doing now. Thank you. And uh, Amelia Schillingford will uh, speak to some of the uh, staffing challenges we have um, and strategies on our inpatient unit. Good afternoon, my name is Amelia Schillingford. I am the Chief Nursing Officer here at the Brattleboro Retreat. Linda has allotted me five minutes and I'm gonna do my darndest to keep <laughs> to that uh, time frame. but anyone who knows me knows that that's gonna be a bit of a challenge. Um, as uh, uh, Board Member Chair Tom Hemer mentioned, um, our census uh, in March of 2022 was 45. Uh, and then a year later in 2023, it was 95. 
And the only way we could do that, as Linda mentioned, was the rapid expansion of our staffing needs um, and hiring on travel staff. And so what we've spent this year doing, 2023, is figuring out how to run a hospital uh, with effectively having 50% of the frontline staff as travel staff. Currently, um, we have 42 uh, travel nurses, 12 travel RP, uh, LPNs, 53 behavioral health techs, whom we refer to as BHTs, and 11 social workers. Um, we, that means that about 60% of our licensed staff, so RNs and LPNs, are travels, while about 30% of our BHTs are travel staff. Um, in the social work domain, um, the need is for 19 social workers. By the end of February, they expect to have 12 core. So they are on trend to um, becoming more majority core staff. The focus, again, as I said, for the 2023 has been how to run a hospital with 50% staff while maintaining um, patient quality of patient care and safety. Um, and we've done this through a variety of ways. Uh, the first was to establish a nursing leadership team. When we started off the year in 2023, about 30% of the nursing leaders were themselves travel staff. Uh, and now uh, it is 90% uh, core staff. The second was to uh, improve our communication process across departments. So improving communication between the clinical nurse managers, the nursing leadership, the schedulers, and our recruitment um, folks uh, to, again, make that process of uh, recruitment to interview to hiring a lot faster. We realized that our, in order to be successful, uh, our travel staff needed two weeks of orientation. Um, anyone will tell you that it's a much longer period of orientation than most hospitals offer, but we feel that it is imperative uh, to set the travel staff up for success to deliver quality care that they receive two weeks of orientation. Um, Travelers were placed on teams uh, to work uh, with a unit and have a clinical nurse manager instead of floating around the hospital. This was to uh, decrease the burden on core staff um, and help travel staff feel like they are authentic members of the team, which they are. Um, we had scheduled weekly reviews so we could identify skilled travel staff and provide extensions, trying to maintain continuity of staffing and care. Uh, as well as early identification of staff that were not working out. Um, and finally, identification of travel staff who would be interested in coming on core. And we were able to convert um, several staff from travel staff to core staff, uh, including several uh, people in the position of nursing leadership. So that was 2023. In 2024, we're going to be focusing on growing our core staff. We're going to be doing that in two different ways. One will be recruiting, and the other will be growing our own talent. Um, on the recruiting aspects, we do not want to be poaching nurses from other hospitals in Vermont. Um, all of the CNOs have spoken together, and that is something that um, we agree is, is not, uh, not fair playing and not the kind of organization and state we want to be. So um, we are working with a recruitment company to recruit nurses from other states, particularly states where there is low satisfaction um, for nursing work. So we have targeted, a, uh, developed a campaign to target nurses working in Texas and Florida. Um, and we are looking at uh, creating an advertising campaign that really highlights the strengths of our hospital including our union relations, our nursing to staffing ratios, um, as well as uh, the, the state of Vermont itself. Um, we have uh, two recruiters in our HR department who in fact have worked the very positions they are recruiting for. So Grace Albert Gardner is herself an RN. Uh, she recruits the RNs and she has worked here as an RN and as a clinical nurse manager, Jessica Tully, uh, recruits our BHTs, and she herself has been a BHT here in the hospital. 
So that will be recruiting staff from other states and then growing our own talents. Right now we partner with uh, multiple nursing schools, five nursing schools across three different states. For RNs, they come here for their clinical rotations with their own faculty. We also partner with six different schools across five different states for nurse practitioners. Um, and we've had several, several medically trained nurse practitioners come to the retreat, work here in a medical capacity while enrolled in school, performing their clinicals here, um, graduating and then going on to become uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners as part of the uh, medical team. Um, and we have two people currently pursuing that path right now. We have a tuition reimbursement program for, um, our, for our staff. One is a tuition reimbursement for all staff that speaks generally to current job skills that uh, prepare staff for further career in behavioral health field. And then we have a second program that is specifically dedicated to employees who wish to pursue nursing degrees, whether that is an associate's degree, bachelor's or master's. Um, the uh, employees who qualify um, can receive 5,000 per semester, 30,000 for the degree, uh, sorry, that's 30,000 a year for the degree, it's prorated um, based on part-time work, um, and the agreement is that for every year of tuition assistance, the employee agrees to work at the retreat for a year. In 2024, we will be developing our own nursing apprenticeship and residency program. We last had an internship program uh, in 2003, and we recognize that along with the other hospitals in the states, we want to create our own pipeline program as well. So we will be developing this apprenticeship program, partnering with Vermont uh, colleges that uh, offer nursing degrees. We're also looking to partner with BMH to uh, provide a wider range of learning opportunities. And then we would like to develop a, we plan to develop a residency phase to help nurses tra transfer from uh, being uh, students into being uh, novice nurses. And we hope that both of those things will contribute to core staff retention. Um, separately, on a separate side note, we have a psychology intern program. Um, that is uh, approved by the American Psychological Association uh, that provides pre-doctoral psychology internships. Uh, one of the primary goals is to increase the number of psychologists in the state of Vermont. There have been 35 candidates who have completed the program. 11 of them have went on to work at the retreat in some capacity and seven of them continue to do so. We currently have eight trainees and then an additional three former interns who have returned to the retreat to do a uh, postdoctoral fellowships. Okay. You want me to stop? I can keep going. <laughs> no, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Amelia. Okay, I'm just gonna, in the interest of time, I won't repeat anything, so I'm just gonna uh, close this uh, presentation with a couple of points. One, we know that the amount of money being spent on travel labor is not sustainable. It's not sustainable from a morale perspective or the burden administratively on the organization. We will develop a plan and we will submit that as the Green Mountain Care Board um, is requesting in the time frame. It's our biggest strategic challenge um, and impediment to success. So it's a priority for us. Um, we're gonna continue to expand our service offerings for children and adolescents uh, through the outpatient um, area. So we're looking at PHP and IOP for adolescents. Um, we are hoping to move forward on the, uh, the uh, bid that we submitted um, to DCF and other agencies to reopen um, adolescent residential services and to be able to have 15 adolescent PRTF beds by the end of 2024. Um, we're looking to expand our shared services arrangement with Brattleboro Memorial Hospital. Um, it's been a fabulous partnership. They're wonderful and um, we will continue uh, to work with them to see where we can consolidate um, administrative functions um, and resources so that both of us can stay focused on cost uh, control. Um, and last, um, we are working um, and looking at a potential partnership with Northstar, the FQHC, um, in Springfield to see if we can bring some FQHC services into the Brattleboro area 
um, through a partnership again with BMH, the retreat, HCRS, um, and the dental clinic um, in Brattleboro. So those are our key points. Um, you know, the Brattleboro retreat remains a, a key statewide resource for mental health services. Um, we work every hard to deliver on our collective commitment to be there for the people that need um, intense and outpatient mental health services. Um, we, we respect uh, that the funding for the retreat comes primarily from uh, the Vermonters um, and we will um, spend their hard earned money as efficiently and responsibly as we can. Uh, so thank you for giving us this opportunity. Um, we do appreciate this chance to talk about the retreat and the turnaround that it's had. Um, it remains fragile. I mean, we're not out of the woods. We've got to keep, keep our eye on the ball all the time, um, and we will uh, do that. So thank you, and thank you to the staff of the Green Mountain Care Board for their uh, support and help. Thank you all for your presentation. And I hadn't appreciated that a number of you were new, so thank you for signing up for this work and taking on these important roles. Um, I'll turn it to Mr. Batista. Um, Jeff, do you have any information for us to share? Uh, yes, I'd like to run through the um, staff presentation uh, with an eye to time. Thank you. So just confirming that everyone can see the slide on the screen. Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Jeff Batista. I am Associate Director of the Health Systems Finance Team. Um, and I'll be presenting the hospital budget with uh, Russ McCracken, staff attorney, and uh, an acknowledgement to the remaining members of the hospital finance team, Matt, Flora, Elena, uh, for their assistance in uh, making this presentation. So I'll turn it over to Russ for the first legal slides. Uh, thanks, Jeff. So <clears throat> just briefly, the <clears throat> as you all know, the Green Mountain Care Board reviews has reviewed historically the hospital budgets for Vermont's 14 community hospitals. Um, <clears throat> there was a change in 2020 under Act 140 uh, that modified the hospital budget review statute and uh, extended the board's review uh, to all hospitals, not just general hospitals. So that now includes psychiatric care hospitals, although it excludes psychiatric care hospitals run by the state of Vermont. So effectively that leaves one additional hospital and that's the Brattleboro Retreat that falls under the board's uh, hospital budget review. Um, <clears throat> it's the board's Review is based on uh, several statutory factors and uh, the guidance that the board puts out annually. <clears throat> um, that includes a number of, of factors, <clears throat> labor expenses, utilization, pharmaceutical cost inflation, uh, some other factors in here, um, which I think everyone is uh, familiar with from our uh, extensive review of the uh, other 14 hospitals uh, this summer. <clears throat> uh, so we can go to the next slide, Jeff. <clears throat> um, this is the first review, the first year that the Brattleboro Retreats budget is subject to a full review. Um, there was some provision in Act 140 when it was passed that allowed the board to kind of gradually scale up the scope of the review from 2020 up uh, as long as a full review is conducted for the FY24 budget. Uh, so that's where we are now at this point, and that's what we're doing. Um, we think it's important to note from the staff perspective <clears throat> and for the board's review that the Brattleboro Retreat um, is quite different than a community hospital. And that comes through <clears throat> uh, in the Brattleboro Retreats budget. <clears throat> um, it has a different scope of operations. Uh, it has a different role in the state's healthcare system. Uh, I, I think it's clear, but I do also want to note that the Brattleboro Retreat has a different fiscal year than the other hospitals, that it's a January 1 
uh, start date, which is why we're conducting this review now and not um, over the summer with the other hospitals. <clears throat> and the way we think about things like patient migration and service areas are uh, different for the retreat than they are for a, a community hospital. Um, so, <clears throat> and Jeff will run through the analysis here in more detail, but in reviewing the retreat's budget, uh, we're interpreting and thinking about the board's FY24 guidance with these differences, um, with these differences in mind. Um, and I think that, you know, come through in how the review is presented and also, you know, a couple of specific areas like the comparisons um, between the Brattleboro Retreat, I think, are more apt to other psychiatric hospitals. Um, we tried to look at, uh, I think, inflation, not for general hospitals, but for psychiatric hospitals. Um, and I think there are some other factors in, in the review that are tailored more specifically to the retreat. Uh, so I think with that, I am going to turn it back to you, Jeff. Awesome. Thank you, Russ. Um, so I am to a certain extent preaching to the choir right now, um, so I'm going to run through the uh, the introductory information a bit quickly. But um, all this to say is that the Vermont legislator has made, legislature has made it clear that mental health care investment is a critical part of our um, health care strategy. Um, the Act 167 does help, um, does state that uh, uh, support equal access to appropriate mental health care that meets the standards of quality, access, and affordability equivalent to other components of the health care system, uh, namely physical health, um, as part of an integrated and holistic system of care. Um, some broader trends and additional context. Um, mental health care is in high demand. Uh, there is also a uh, shortage of inpatient health care, uh, particularly for adolescents. The retreat is the only um, facility in the state that uh, works with children or does inpatient uh, child and adolescent uh, um, care. Also, the health care workforce is stretched as alluded to by the retreat. Um, this is in part due to demographic change, um, both shaping the workforce and the people seeking care, um, increasing demand for that. Housing costs and just a general shortage of housing, no matter what you're willing to pay. And uh, in the retreats case in particular, there's regional competition among several hospitals within, let's say, commuting distance, 30, 45 minutes. And um, that uh, creates some fierce competition for nurses, behavioral health technicians, and uh, social workers, um, key members of the healthcare workforce. Moving into the basics of the budget, um, the board or the um, the retreat has requested an NPR increase of 6.6%, um, up to $97.4 million in fiscal year 2024. Um, however, it's given the high public payer um, percentage here, 80% uh, or 81% coming from Medicaid and Medicare. Um, the commercial rate change is uh, not that significant, both in its magnitude and its uh, absolute amount. Only $154 in additional net revenue expected there. Uh, what does this mean for revenue at the retreat? Um, so given that public payers fund most of the revenue, uh, utilization is really what is raising NPR. Um, you'll note the uh, in this chart, it's orange or this the color uh, above the bottom. Um, and that's contributing to about 87% uh, of the total revenue increases uh, budget to budget 22 to 24. Um, an additional 9% is from rate. Um, this is generally linked to the Medicaid per diem increase from about 2,500 to 3,100. Um, in fiscal year 2022, um, that is constant through the remainder of uh, fiscal year 24. And uh, the third category, payer mix, um, there was an agreement whereby commercial and Medicare admissions who lose coverage during their care at the retreat are now treated as Medicaid. So that explains the gray bump at the top of the Medicaid bar chart there. Uh, how does this all boil down to net uh, patient revenue? Um, 
So overall gross patient revenue is up 47%. That's driven by an increase in the um, utilization of inpatient care primarily, though the outpatient share is growing at a slightly faster rate um, with that 56.7% there. Uh, deductions are up as well, which comes to a net. Um, if one were to take all of the blue um, bars and subtract the yellow colored bars, uh, you come up with a dark blue line, which is NPR. Uh, take that same blue line and turn it into the blue bars here. Uh, you're looking at a um, income statement that is very heavily driven by inpatient or um, by patient care rather than other sources of operating revenue, such as grants, um, whether that's the COVID relief funds you see in the light blue in 2022 in this graph, or the um, other grant sources are starting to dry up as well. That said, as noted during the presentation by the retreat, the operating expenses are up quite a bit, and that is largely driven by traveler expenses. Um, I have color coded the non MD staff in dark red and the um, the traveler staff increase in dark yellow. Uh, so you can see that uh, non MD staff that spending is about constant, uh, going up slightly, uh, but the 75 percentage increase in traveler expenses uh, between 22 actuals and 24 budget are um, quite large. All this means that operating margin is down as the operating expenses rise faster than net operating revenue. Um, currently, the margin for oper the operating margin is about 1.3%. Um, moving to the balance sheet, uh, the retreat is, let's say, leaner and meaner um, with uh, far few liabilities. The liabilities have gone down at a faster rate than gross assets, uh, yielding a net asset increase of about 18.6%. Uh, to compare it to some other hospitals in Vermont, um, the retreat uh, has a slightly lower operating margin and total margin. Its days cash on hand have gone down over time. Um, and the age of plant, uh, though not uh, favorable compared to the Vermont hospital median, is improving. Uh, moving into some of the narrative responses. Um, the admission rate has, or inpatient admissions um, are improving both in the rate that people are admitted and um, the timing it takes for them to get transferred from uh, the e other EDs to the retreat. Um, so at this point, uh, about 40% of people who are referred to the retreat are admitted. Um, main reasons for not admission include just patients declining treatment. Um, being placed in an alternate facility and other reasons, though I do want to point to the 25.6% out of state insurance coverage concerns and legal status, um, as well as the 14.4% being placed in an alternate facility due to age or treatment. Um, wait times are down, as you see on the graph to the right, um, with more people being admitted within two days and fewer in more than two days. Moving to outpatient wait times, um, there is a 10 week wait for psychotherapy at the Anna Marsh Clinic. Um, there are, is quick turnaround for the virtual intensive outpatient care, as mentioned by the retreat um, in their testimony, as well as the healthcare professionals program um, uh, where healthcare professionals can seek outpatient care uh, for issues related to their job. Uh, in addition, the outpatient um, specialty medicine clinic with the esketamine and the uh, transcranial um, uh, procedure, uh, those post wait times or post intake wait times are up uh, or are relatively high in large part due to physician availability and scheduling. Um, uh, I felt it was important to break down one component of uh, uh, the operating expenses here at the retreat, that being traveler expenses, and um, uh, going through a little exercise, I just want to note that the math is on the next slide. So uh, the financial uh, sustainability of the retreat depends on two things, uh, maxing out their um, census and minimizing their 
expenses, primarily labor expenses. Uh, so there is some room to improve if you look at this from a strictly accounting exercise, no trade-offs, no externalities. Um, at present, um, they are spending approximately 85 or 80, uh, $38.5 million on combined nurse and behavioral health technician FTEs. Um, and that relies on a large uh, component of travelers that you see in the red in the bar graph. If one were to uh, assume that uh, they staffed all of these positions as staff rather than travelers, uh, that would be 21.2 million. Uh, and assuming that everyone who was staffed got a 25% combined salary and fringe raise, uh, that would only rise to 26.5 million. Uh, given that uh, so much of the revenue for the retreat comes from public payers, particularly Medicaid, um, uh, travelers are being paid by the public purse. And um, should, assuming a one-to-one uh, -one net patient revenue to operation expenses ratio, which is pretty close um, to where the retreat stands today, uh, you're looking at anywhere, uh, saving anywhere from 8.9 million to 12.7 million in the, um, uh, the two scenarios after the status quo in this graph. Uh, just uh, breaking down the math here, you know, changes to the um, number of FTEs that are travelers versus staff, as well as changes to um, the cost per FTE, assuming a 25% raise in salary and fringe. Uh, so with all this information in mind, the staff recommendation is to approve the budget as submitted with the following conditions. Uh, proven NPR FPP plus deductions growth as submitted at 6.6%, approve of the commercial change in charge as submitted at 1.9%, and an additional condition, which um, I drew from uh, um, other budget orders uh, earlier this year, is to include an additional condition for monthly reporting and to submit within three months an improvement plan to address traveler expenses. Uh, the rationale behind this is uh, utilization, not rate, is uh, driving the NPR growth um, at the Brad Ball retreat, uh, given its public payer mix. Um, traveler expenses are rising faster than staff expenses and patient revenue in general. And most of the traveler expenses are paid by uh, Medicaid, assuming a one-to-one -one NPR to operation expenses ratio. So I will pass it on to Russ for some uh, standard budget condition slides. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, these are the same standard budget conditions that the board had approved um, for hospitals over the summer. Uh, for consistency, we were recommending that we continue to use the same uh, conditions here for the retreat. Uh, there are a couple of instances where I changed some dates uh, so that it kind of made more sense with a January 1 fiscal year. Um, so I'll just run through them. Uh, approving uh, an NPR um, growth rate in NPR for FY24. We're approving an overall change in charge and commercial rate increase at not more than um, uh, a percentage increase over FY23. Um, that has no commercial payer or no commercial rate increase for any payer more than that amount. Um, and the commercial rate increases can be less um, as negotiated between the hospital and the payer. Uh, next condition is there's a the commercial rate cap is a maximum and subject to negotiation. Um, it's not to be represented as <clears throat> um, an amount guaranteed uh, by the GMCB. <clears throat> um, next condition is the um, retreat expected commercial NPR um, based on this order is an amount that uh, we will take from their budget submission if it's approved without modification. Um, and they'll report back their actual expected commercial NPR um, 
clearly, given the different payer mix of the retreat, the commercial rate is less impactful for the Brattleboro retreat than it is for other hospitals. Um, condition E, uh, we have some reporting conditions in here. Um, the Brattleboro retreat will file its uh, actual up year to date FY24 results. Uh, I think I think I need to update the dates here too, but we'll just push those out kind of appropriately um, for a, a January 1 fiscal year. Uh, we can go on to the next slide. Uh, there's some more requ reporting requirements here. Um, I think we may need to fix these dates as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, but it, there will be uh, reporting for the FY23 actuals, um, kind of when those are available. Uh, other ret retreat uh, report its FY23 audited financials, um, again, at a date that's sort of appropriate for when those are finished. Uh, requirement that the retreat participate in telephonic check-ins at the discretion of the board chair um, to discuss their FY24 year-to-date performance. Um, and any the retreat will advise the board of any material changes to its 24 budget revenues or expenses. Um, go on to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, this is the same wait times requirement that we've had for other hospitals that uh, the Brattleboro Retreat would develop a system to be able to measure and report um, referral lag and visit lag um, kind of as appropriate, I think, for the Brattleboro Retreat. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure if we have more to say about that. We can go on to the next slide. Um, Brattleboro Retreat will participate with the board's Act 167 work, again, to the extent that's applicable. Um, the Brattleboro Retreat shall timely file all forms of information um, and data requested by the board. Uh, and then just some boilerplate. Um, conditions here at the end. Thanks, Russ. Um, so the suggested motion language is outlined here. Uh, Move to approve the Bradwell Retreats budget as submitted with an approximately uh, 97.4 um, fiscal year 2024 budgeted NPR FVP, a 1.9% rating, commercial rate increase. Um, between fiscal year 23 and 24 and subject to the standard uh, hospital budget conditions as previously approved by the board with additional conditions as follows uh, that reporting for the travelers within three months. Um, uh, the vote is scheduled for today. Um, I understand that uh, uh, timing is a bit compressed and perhaps we'd like to move this to next week. Uh, it is the earliest that um, we were able to do the presentation, but uh, happy to adjust the schedule as requested. Um, so I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jeff and, and Russ. Um, I'll open it up to board member questions and comments for our staff or for the Brattleboro leadership. Um, I would say at the outset that I would like to get to a vote today if it's possible um, and let everyone go home and not have to worry about this uh extending out but if we can't we can't so we can see where the board members are and, and take it from there so i'll open it up to the other board members hi this is robin i'll go ahead and jump in i just had a couple questions related to the um emr upgrade i was noticing in your submission that you didn't necessarily assume that the EMR upgrade would impact your revenue, which is certainly something we've seen with the general hospitals. Um, so I wondered if you could just touch a little bit on that um, 
and ex and talk a little bit to the, how the EMR upgrade may or may not affect um, your patient care or your administrative burden, those sorts of things. Yeah, this is Linda Rossi. I'll take a stab at that. Um, we're looking, per, if assuming we get you know the proper approvals, um, we'd be looking to start uh, the transition to a new EMR mid-year 2024. Um, so I'm not really sure we're going to see any revenue impact in 2024. I think it'll hit in 2025. It's an 18-month project. Um, we have done some upgrades to our current NetSmart system, um, and we are seeing improvements in terms of cycle times, but not no major impact on revenue at this time. So that'll be a 2025 um, impact um, projection for us. Thank you. That makes sense. Um, that was really the only question I had. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. This is Tom Walsh. Um, thanks for presenting to us um, and thank you for the work that you do. It's hard. It's needed um, and it's personally valued. Um, I'm ready to approve the budget as submitted. I did, I did want to comment on the um, analysis um, that was shown about salaries, that um, paying for travelers is, is very expensive and can be a short-term um, means to get through. But in my experience with other healthcare organizations around the country, it's a bit like payday loans. Um, once started, it's hard to stop. It's hard to dig out. Um, and what um, Mr. Batista's analysis showed was that um, increasing the salary of, for your existing staff or any oncoming staff by 25% would be less expensive for Vermont taxpayers than what's currently being um, paid for travelers. I know you can't recruit as fast um, to get people to move to Vermont. So I could. This, I'm not asking Jeff to do this, but I imagine we could do a similar calculation that had a 15% increase in wages plus a voucher for a year's rent in the Brattleboro region, and it may still be less expensive than paying travelers. So I'm um, really trying to um, do what you can to retain staff and recruit, um, I think is really important. And I, I heard your, your concern about being perceived as um, poaching staff from other places. And I wonder if you could um, just say a little bit more about the agreement that you've reached with other healthcare systems about not poaching. So, so Dr. Welsh, um, I, I... Uh, attend the VAS CNO monthly meeting. And during those meetings, uh, we primarily talk about the nursing shortage in the States and what we are doing for recruiting. And in a sort of offhand manner, we spoke with each other about the agreement to basically not try to steal each other's staff, that the main issue was that we needed to create new nurses, new LPNs through the pipeline program and or attracts nurses from other parts of the state, uh, sorry, other parts of the country. Um, and so there was no sort of official agreement. It was really a collegial uh, conversational, um, uh, collaborative conversation about, about uh, how to, all, how we can all work together to address the state's needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just expand on that for a second. I mean, my background is human resources, and I think um, it's an unspoken commitment to our hospital colleagues that we will not directly solicit any of their staff. I mean, certainly if they were interested in a career change or wanted to come to the Brattle Bar Retreat, we would consider them, but we would never, um, you know, have a job fair across the street from one of our acute care hospitals. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, we honor that commitment as HR professionals and we'll continue to do so. Okay, thank you. I can, um, if it's safe for a minute, I could pop in. Uh, 
Thank you, Ms. Rossi and team. I, I appreciate um, the submission, the candor, the conversation. Um, like everyone else, I and and Jeff's comments, I'm fully in agreement that um, the mental health care provide that you provide at Brattleboro and uh, others provide around the state is is one of the very most important um, resources we have for for Vermonters in the healthcare system. So I applaud applaud the work and appreciate the dedication. And um, I know you've your team has done some amazing work over the last few years, you know, with work with Diva and 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 the Medicaid support to 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 become financially sustainable and be the resource that you've become. As you, as you know, I, I work as an emergency physician and um and I I've noted noticed the the speed at which we can get patients transferred down to Brattleboro, the impact that is, it's not that we're not boarding still, but it's what it was two years ago and now is is substantially different. So thank you so much for for that and for for all of us. Um, I support the budget as submitted. Um, I just want to ask a few questions that came up uh, during during the hearing. And so um, uh, one is, I think I just want to like note the exposure. I mean, not, this isn't like this is clearly something you all know that that you that Brattleboro has more so than a lot of the the rest of the state to swings in contract labor costs. So if if next year was a high cost year as opposed to the sort of subtle downtrend that we have right now, I would imagine that would be a big challenge for the retreat. Is there any any thoughts on that on, on how that would be managed if that occurred? Yeah, that would be probably devastating for the retreat should there be a major shift on the cost of um, travelers. I, I, you know, we're aware of it every single day and we are recruiting as um, aggressively as we can. Um, we have some ideas. I mean, we've been working together uh, with, you know, Amelia in terms of what can we do to train resources. Our biggest population here are behavioral health techs. That's our biggest employee population. Uh, those are individuals that have a lot of options in the area. Um, we have to train them. I mean, they don't come licensed to the retreat. So I think expanding our investments in developing uh, that talent pool so that we can pull them in and offer them a career opportunity here is something we're going to focus on. I mean, as Amelia said, we'd like to uh, create a nurse residency program. So we have to grow our own. It's not easy to do that. I've done that in other places where I've worked. It's challenging, but that's one area we need to focus. We're going to look, are going to expand our recruitment focus out of the region and start recruiting nationally. Um, we do are fortunate enough to have a housing option that if we were to bring in um, out of the regional you know, area resources to work here, we can offer them housing and we can make that free. I've also been working on some wage possibilities uh, for frontline staff to get creative with that. All of our frontline staff are unionized, so that requires um, collaboration with the union. So it's delicate, it's, it's hard and it's delicate. It's very challenging to manage turnover. 50% of your direct patient care staff every 13 weeks. This is hard on our numbers, certainly, but it's also very challenging from a morale perspective, and it stretches our infrastructure resources, training, education, recruitment. I mean, this constant turnover. We don't want to have this long term for the retreat, and we're going to do our absolute best. It's a difficult labor market, as you know, in healthcare in general. But if you look at the number of healthcare workers interested in working in psych, it's even more narrow. So retention is really important to us. Um, I think morale has come a long way in the past two years in the workforce. Our union relations, labor relations have improved considerably, and that's you know that's also helpful. So we're trying to attack this from various perspectives. Thank you for that. Um, one other question that's not related to that is just a quick question that came up, and maybe Jeff is the better person to answer this, but how does one lose their Medicare coverage during a hospitalization. Is that to get that right? If someone loses Medicare coverage, they become Medicaid? Correct. Yes. I mean, so, you know, they have a certain amount. If you're Medicare, when you exhaust your Medicare coverage, 
uh, then you you know the patient can apply for Medicaid, and we help with that process. So it's like a length uh, of hospitalization. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I'll pass on to whoever's next. Great. Thank you. I just have a, actually just a couple of quick questions. Um, one was what percentage of your average daily census is Vermonters versus out of state um, patients? Mm. Off the top of your head, would you say? Well, all the Medicaid pretty much. Um, yeah. 90%. 90% is Vermonters. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say at least 80, 90. 90. Okay. No, I was just curious. Um, I also, I'm just wondering, how, what do you use as we're thinking about, you know, reviewing your budget in the future years, um, you know, and building a process that's more, uh, you know, relatable to, you know, your facility. I'm just wondering, what do you use as a benchmark, um, a comparable group to sort of benchmark your own costs, your access, your quality, productivity, turnover, days, cash on hand, things like that. Like, what is your comparison group? That you all use? That's very challenging because we looked at uh, the organizations that had been identified by the Green Mountain Care Board and went through them one by one and honestly trying to find a match was very difficult. Some of them are part of health systems, some of them are for-profit organizations, um, you know, some of them don't have the patient population that we have. So it's it's cha we're we're challenged trying to find a benchmark that we feel is appropriate. We look forward to you know refining our search and hopefully coming up with some information. I, I you know I've done some Google searches myself to find some metrics. It's on staffing ratios as an example, and you know I couldn't find anything that was current. Um, that or actually fit our population. I mean, we a third of our patients roughly are involuntary patients. They're more, they're on the level of a state hospital. So, you know, we, we certainly can look at state hospital in terms of those benchmarks, but the other two thirds and are, are just different. So we, we're struggling with finding an appropriate benchmark and we will continue to look um, to see where there might be some information. I looked at the behavioral health um, organizations under AHA, the American Hospital Association, I didn't find a lot there either. So, you know, I welcome okay. any insight the Mountain Care Board may have. Okay, so I guess that, that means that in the past, the Brattleboro Retreat has not done its own benchmarking for performance. No, in any way. not that I'm aware, not that I'm aware. Okay. okay. And the, the last is really just a clarifying question, I think, for the record. Um, just so that we're, I, th I think this is probably a typo, but I wanted to check. Um, uh, you know, as I read through the narrative on the, um, on page two of the narrative, there's a description of fiscal year 22 being, you know, abysmal and uh, experiencing an operating loss of $582,000. And then later in the narrative on page seven, um, there's a description of an operating margin positive of 10 point six percent and when i looked at the income statement it was a eight million dollar gain so i just wanted to clarify for the record that it's in fact an eight million dollar gain for fiscal year 22 and not the negative five hundred six hundred thousand that was listed in the narrative that's correct that was 10. a type okay okay thank you that those are my questions thank you for for answering and i you know i i echo my colleague on the board's comments about, you know, uh, your efforts to turn around the Brattleboro Retreat and the vital asset that you provide for our community. So we really appreciate all your work. Thank you. Um, just out of curiosity, um, what EMR were you on and which one do you think you're moving to? We're, yeah, we're currently on Avatar um, through NetSmart is the vendor, and we're planning, hoping to move to Meditech. And then um, the revenue impact that you may see from that change, you, you thought it might be 25 before you see that. And are you anticipating that being to the positive or negative? Sometimes with these EMR implementations, there's a lag and getting it going and getting the claims right but there's also an upside opportunity to capture more of the work did yeah. you mean upside or downside for 25 
Well, we're hoping for an upside. Um, that's, you know, really <laughs> good. The yeah, we have a broken EMR right now. And um, although we're working to improve it, this should, I mean, I think we'll see a, a little bit of a dip as we, you know, ramp up that system. But then I we should be operating far more efficiently on the revenue management side. So, yes, positive impact is the plan. Yeah. And then, um, on the salaries, like uh, for the for the nursing for the nursing staff, how do those compare to other hospitals? I thought there might have been a slide on that here. Yeah. So, am I reading this correctly? For RNs staff, it's a about a hundred one thousand dollar cost per FTE. That's total cost, including benefits and healthcare and all that. Yeah. That that and overtime and premium pay and all the other things that we give. Yes, I. Didn't do those calculations, but they sound reasonably correct. Great. Um, I had no other questions. Thank you very much for your work and in, in getting Brattleboro in a really good place and um, for the service that you all do provide. It's obviously critically important in so many different ways. Um, so it sounds like the board's prepared to vote and, and I would be as well. So I will make a motion. I'll see if there's a second. And then I'll open up to the healthcare advocate and the public comment, and then we'll see if we can have a vote. So I move to approve Brattleboro Retreat's budget as submitted with a $97,379,571 fiscal year 24 budget, NPR FPP, a 1.9% rate increase from fiscal year 2023 to 2024, and subject to the standard hospital budget conditions as, pre as previously approved by the board. Um, and an additional condition that Brattleboro Retreat shall submit to the board within three months, a plan addressing Brattleboro Retreat's efforts to reduce expenses and reliance on traveling staff. Could I make a, I wonder if I could make a friendly amendment, which would be to add that the standard budget condition dates could be amended by staff to reflect the retreats fiscal year, because if I interpreted what Russ is saying right, the staff need to make some tweaks there. Yes, right? I think the friendly Russ? amendment, yes, I think that that is what Russ had said. With that friendly amendment, I will second. Any other board discussion on the motion? And uh, the healthcare advocate, do you have any comments? Just a brief comment. Thank you, Chair Foster. Just wanted to thank all the board staff for a great presentation and all your hard work on this. And also thanks to the retreat for the great presentation and for your willingness to address the concerns that we raised um, related to the patient financial assistance policies. And we look forward to continuing to support you coming into compliance, compliance with Act 119. Thank you. And I'll open it up to public comment via the raise uh, raise the hand function. All right, seeing none. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Um, oh, Member Holmes, I didn't hear you. Did did you vote? I, I think Holmes? I couldn't get my mute off fast enough. So yes, I. <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> All right. um, the motion carries unanimously, and we'll work on getting out um, an order for you folks. And this was a really nice presentation. So thank you to our staff and to the Brattleboro Retreat folks. This was really um, this was enjoyable and a good presentation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas and, and happy holidays. Have a good day and happy, hol <laughs> happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda, we have the Medicare benchmark proposal and a potential vote noticed. So I'll turn it over to Michelle Degree, our health policy project director, and Lindsay Kill, our data analytic and information chief.
I believe I've unmuted myself and I confirm that you all can hear me. Yes, it's the nodding head. Um, it will just be myself today, Chair Foster. Um, I have a relatively brief presentation for you after last week. Um, let me share my screen. I do want to start by noting that we did not receive any public comments. Russ, I see that your hand is up, so I'm going to stop talking. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I want to first um, start off by saying we did not receive any public comment directly related to the Medicare benchmark for 2024. Um, so with that, I'm gonna just review a couple of points that we made last week, and then I've um, put some suggested motion language together for you all, and I'm here for any um, outstanding questions you may have. So with that, um, again, the staff recommendation was to use the maximum allowable trend for one care per month Medicare benchmarks. Uh, those, as you see on the screen, are 4.3% for non-ESRD population and 6.7% for the ESRD population. That translates to a request of advanced shared savings of $9.9 .9 million, and that is used to fund statewide blueprint for health programs and SASH. Um, the breakout is there uh, should you wish to see it. Again, just highlighting the trade-offs for using that maximum trend. I'll focus here on the con, which is the maximum trend may endanger the ability of the state to fulfill its financial targets from the APM agreement. Um, current modeling does not put us in uh, within that threshold or kind of have any concerns for staff on, on going over that limit. Um, so even though it's listed as a con, we don't foresee that actually becoming an issue with the 2024 benchmark. Again, highlighting the previous trend limits, I know there was some conversation about this last week um, that Lindsay was able to really um, helpfully answer for us. I just wanted to show this again um, for uh, the past performance years of the all pair model, including our first extension year of 2023. That's it. Are there any other questions before I move to the, the motion language for you all? None from, from myself. I see lots of shaking heads. Okay. So with that, um, I've put some suggested language here on the screen. I'll let you read it over. It's just, again, taking that staff recommendation. Um, and I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you. Um, I'll go ahead and make the motion. Um, I move to approve a Medicare benchmark of the staff recommended maximum allowable trend rates of 4.3% for non ESRD and 6.7% for ESRD and to include the advance of the $9,956,390 for the Blueprint for Health and SASH programs. I'll second it. Any board comment or discussion? And any comment or points from the healthcare advocate? Nothing from us, Chair Foster. Thank you. And any public comment? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. Gree. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. All right, you too. Um, we'll take a quick five minute break um, and then we'll come back at 2.50. Zoom our hearing. Uh, we have one last substantive agenda item, which is the One Care Vermont fiscal year 24 budget um, with a potential vote noticed. And I'll turn it to Michelle Sawyer, our health policy project director and Marissa Melamed our Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, and they are also being assisted by Matt Sutter, our Health Systems Finance Principal Analyst, and Staff Attorney Russ McCracken. Thank you, Chair Foster. I'm gonna kick off the presentation. Um, thank you, uh, Michelle had to be out, so I was filling in, but she's jumping back in as of today. So we're gonna work through this as a team. Um, and pick up our conversation from last week. So if you'll allow me, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. 
All right, is that showing up for everybody? Okay, I'll I'll begin. So again, thanks and good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the board and, and the public. Um, today's discussion is the ACO Oversight FY 2024 ACO Budget for One Care Vermont. Um, and we are gonna walk through budget modification and approval recommendations, uh, any board discussion, questions, public comment, uh, and a potential vote if you're ready to do so. I am going to turn over the next couple of slides to Staff Attorney Russ McCracken to walk you through the budget review uh, standards and criteria. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Marissa. So I, we thought it would be useful just to walk through <clears throat> the board's rule on how the budget review, um, the board's rule on budget review process. Uh, this is for ACOs with more than 10,000 attributed lives. So a couple of excerpts are on the slides here. First is the board rule 5405. This sets out the review process. Um, first is sort of an overall principle, the ACO has the burden of justifying its proposed budget to the board. The rule goes on then to say, in deciding whether to approve or modify the proposed budget uh, of an ACO, the board will take into consideration four things, and it's one, two, three, and four. The first are any benchmarks established under section 5402 of this rule. We'll look at that next. The criteria listed in 18 VSA 9382B1, that's the ACO oversight statute, uh, the elements of the all payer model agreement, and lastly, any other issues at the discretion of the board. Uh, so we can look at the next slide. Section 5402 of the rule says the board may establish benchmarks for indicators uh, to be used by the ACO in developing and preparing their proposed budgets. The established, and as a reminder, the board did do this. They're in guidance. Uh, they're called targets in the guidance. Um, for clarity, though, the target and the bench, lowercase benchmark here are the same thing. Um, so as, as you're familiar with them, there are uh, those targets established in the guidance. And the rule goes on to say that the established benchmarks will be included in any annual reporting or budget review manual, so they're in the guidance, and will assist the board in determining whether to approve or modify an ACO's proposed budget. So first the board will look at those proposed budget targets, and then next, uh, under the rule, the board would look at the statutory criteria. Marissa, we can go to the next slide, um, which I have so for reference, excerpted and put into the slide here. Um, I don't think it's needed to read through all of these, um, but they are the uh, 16 different uh, criteria that are set out in the statute. Um, there are some, uh, Marissa, we can, I think just flip through these slides. So, um, sorry, we can go back one. Um, <clears throat> so the board should, under the rule, the board looks at the targets. The board looks at these 16 different criteria, uh, elements of the all-payer model agreement, and any other issues at the discretion of the board. Um, that's how the rule work, uh, how the budget process works under the board's rule. And I think if there are specific or detailed questions about this, it, the board might consider whether that's appropriate for an executive session uh, for advice of counsel. Um, and with that, Marissa, I can turn it back to you, I think. Okay, thank you so much. So this slide is a summary of the public comments that we've received on the One Care budget submission so far. This has been updated as we've moved through the presentations. Uh, in total, 14 public comments were received as of today. 
Um, here are the themes uh, that we heard in the public comments. I'll, I'll go through them for you. Um, comments that discuss the value of OneCare's improved health outcomes, higher quality care, lower cost, and enhanced coordination of care, the value of care coordination and strengthened partnerships with local care organizations. Comments also express concerns about access to care and long wait times to see providers, concerns about cost of healthcare in Vermont, concerns about the effectiveness of one care administrative costs relative to demonstrated value, um, the loss of the Blue Cross Blue Shield program and increasing executive salaries. Uh, we received just one new comment from the last presentation and that was from uh, Health First, the Independent Practice Association. All public comments um, where, where commenters wanted their um, remarks posted are on our website for review and the board has you know, receives each of these as they come in. The next slide, again, to repeat, this was reviewed on December 6th. These are the targets that Russ was talking about that were set in advance in guidance so that one care could use them and the board of managers could use them as a, as a guide for setting their budget over the summer. Uh, through the staff analysis, uh, it was determined that of the nine, um, seven were met. I'm not gonna go through each of them individually because we did that on December 6th, um, but two of them were not met, numbers three and four, and that is that the ACO must hold 100% of the Medicare Advance Shared Savings dollars at risk at the entity level and not pass the risk along to the provider networks, um, and that the ACO should increase the risk corridors for all payer programs above the FY23 levels. Um, those, uh, the uh, one care uh, declined to um, meet those parts of the guidance. It was discussed during their hearing. It was discussed at our pre pre previous presentations and we're gonna discuss uh, recommendations there today. Um, and the other one I just wanna draw attention to is number eight. Um, which I'm gonna look on my other screen because it's very small, but the ratio of population health management funding to number of attributed lives must be at a minimum of the FY23 revised budget amount. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, this generated a bit of discussion around the way that those ratios were calculated. Um, the HCA did an analysis, the Green Mountain Care Board um, analyst did an analysis of what that um, ratio looked like and number is. The number that we had in there is 166 per life which is greater um, than the FY23 revised budget amount. We looked at the various, the alternative ways of calculating it um, and found that um, under the alternatives, it's still met, um, except for one alternative where you remove the blueprint dollars. Um, but staff believes in the case of this target that the blueprint dollars should remain as part of it. So um, we did relook at this and, and determine that this, um, this particular target was still met, um, but we but we can discuss, um, you know, population health investment um, and the ratios to attributed lives is going to come back in the discussion um, under some other criteria that we looked at. So that brings us to uh, the staff recommendation. So the options that were presented last week um, and December sixth. Um, have been further refined into a Green Mountain Care Board staff recommendation based on board member discussion and feedback. So I'll go through each of these and there's some accompanying slides uh, that give you some numbers and, and such to help you to help aid in discussion and deliberation. So the first is to modify the ACO risk model. Uh, and that is that one care should increase the Medicare risk corridor from 3% to 4%. Uh, the additional risk uh, so that additional 1% risk should be delegated to one care as, a, as an organization. So it would not be spread out to the risk bearing entities or the hospital. Uh, I'm gonna go through this a little bit more, but we calculated that amount at approximately $5.7 million in additional risk and reward um, for the ACO. Um, and that number is based on budgeted figures from the one care budget and would have to be recalculated based on the uh, the final benchmark, but that was our best estimate with the numbers we, we have. Um, also on this, I want to mention 
um, that the settlement policy, the one care settlement policy would need to be updated to reflect distribution of the additional risk and reward. This is significantly more risk than they are currently holding. Um, and so we recommend that the board would wanna take a look at that settlement policy and how um, any reward that's earned is distributed. We we'll also talk about the risk mitigation on the flip side, on the risk side, the risk mitigation plan that, that, that um, one care would need to have to cover any potential um, losses on this additional risk. The second uh, recommendation is that one care modifies the operating budget and investment in population health and primary care. Um, the recommendation that we're putting forward is to reduce the operating budget by $957,000. This is based on a five-year average ratio of operating expenses to attributed lives. So those ratios that we reviewed, which Matt from our finance team is gonna go through with you again. And this was a methodology that we selected to, um, to try to look at um, the, the operating budget over, over time. Um, and we're gonna discuss some um, you know, other factors in, in making that decision when we get to those slides or making that recommendation. Uh, then we would recommend that you reallocate the operating budget cut to population health primary care programs. So the first recommendation, the modification of the risk model, um, creates significant additional potential um, reward um, or earnings that um, One Care Network can earn. So um, we believe, or the staff believes that uh, One Care may want to look at its budget um, to figure out how to reallocate operating expenses to population health programs to support um, success um, under this increased risk model. Um, and it would also adjust sort of the, the ratios of operating expenses to, um, to population health. So that's the second recommendation. And then the third is to include the reporting, monitoring, and other conditions which were reviewed on December 6th, and we've brought them back with a, with a couple of additions. These are the reporting monitoring requirements um, and other things that One Care is required to do, which we will document in a reporting manual that gets published after the order. Um, and I just want to highlight that the revised budget um, that is in compliance with the board's vote on the FY24 order um, which would be inclusive of any budget modifications and reporting and monitoring requirements that you vote on today that would need to be submitted to the board by April 1st. Um, and then we would schedule a revised budget hearing um, later that month, most likely, or, or early May, as soon as we could to review the revised budget. And as a reminder, this is standard process that we have a revised budget submission because excuse me, attribution numbers are not finalized till after the first of the year. So that's gonna adjust their, their total budget no matter what. Um, and so we'll, you'll want to take a look at that in the spring. <clears throat> excuse me, so that's an overview of the recommendations. Now we have a, several supporting slides, um, which I'm gonna go through with some help from other staff. So on the recommendation to modify the Medicare risk model. So again, this is an increase from 3% to 4% risk corridor. We calculated the value of that additional risk at 5.7 million. Um, the rationale or discussion around this recommendation is that it increases both the upside and the downside risk potential. Um, so it increases the value that can be earned from the cost of operating the ACO. It also increases the risk. So the incentive to, to perform. And again, this was a budget target that was not met. So it was you know, presented to the ACO uh, long before the budget was submitted for their for their consideration. So it's not a surprise that we may uh, order this. Um, the second part of that recommendation is that the ACO holds that additional Medicare risk at the One Care entity level. Um, as submitted, the One Care budget has 1.84 million for provider specific risk mitigation at downside risk. With this recommendation, One Care would hold a total of, again, we estimate about 7.6 million. That's the value of the additional 1% of Medicare plus the existing provider specific risk mitigation. Um, and again, we believe this recommendation supports hospital participation in the model. It increases accountability at the ACO level. 
Um, and, uh, you know, another way of saying that is that the ACO, you know, ha has accountability for their value as an organization um, by backing some of that risk. And then, you know, with the settlement or distribution of that risk, um, there's also kind of a decision about how those dollars could be reallocated in their network or programs if they are earned. Um, I think we've, we've probably gone through this pretty thoroughly, but I'm bringing, there's a slide that brings the math back about this. As a reminder, the bottom calculation there, um, the original target was that OneCare should hold all of the Medicare Advanced Shared Savings Risk which would be 9.95 million. Um, they didn't do that. And after consideration, we're not recommending that. Um, we think increasing the risk corridor actually brings more value. And the total risk that OneCare would hold at the organization level is, is less than that original target, which was the 9.95 million. Um, the total now is uh, you know, that 7.6 that we've been discussing about. If we have more questions about the math, we can we can go through that as well. And again, this would have to be recalculated um, for final number. A couple of other ways of looking at this as a whole. Um, the adjusted risk corridor bumps bumps up um, both the upside and the downside potential for the organization as a whole. Um, and it changes the kind of percentage of provider held risk and one hair care held risk, um, which is which was part of the goal of the of the budget target that one care would hold more as an as an entity. Um, the other line to look at here um, is the bottom line there, the net and net assets and equity, which have accumulated over time um, to uh, over eight million dollars. Um, so the the ACO any ACO um, is required to have um, a risk cap and a risk mitigation plan per the rule. Um, I think that was anticipated in that the you know the ACO may um, propose a higher um, risk level than um, than maybe um, desired, but that hasn't that hasn't happened over the history. It's been more that the the risk level that's been proposed has perhaps been lower than the board wishes it to be. But um there they do have to have a they do have to have a risk cap and a risk mitigation plan. And the um we show the net assets line to show that there is currently an accumulation of net assets and equity um, in excess of what the the cap would be with this additional risk. Um, one other, just a, just a visualization of the risk being held over time. Um, the provider held risk, so most of the risk in OneCare's model is delegated to the risk bearing entities, the hospitals, that's the blue. Um, there, you know, you can see the highest year that was proposed was 2020. That was significantly cut over the COVID years. It has been building up, um, the risk amounts have been building up over time. Um, what we're trying to show here is that what the recommendation does, you can see the 2024 and then the 2024 adjusted. Um, it increases that total risk amount, um, increases the amount held at the one care level, um, perhaps just a little faster than one care has proposed in their in their budget. And the upside and the downside are slightly different because of the Medicare advanced shared savings, which is paid out in advance, so can't be earned at year end, um, but the downside all comes at the end. So that reminds me of one more sort of important piece here in that a reminder that any savings um, or um, payments that need to be made don't happen till about a year after the end of the performance year. So these additional dollars that could be earned or paid out, they go through the entire 2024 performance year. Um, and then those are calculated um, after and paid out after at settlement. We usually have those settlement presentations around November of the following year. So this would this could be monitored over the year through projections. Um, and you know we would have information about how they're doing against um, you know, against those 
against the risk corridors as we go. And that's not money that would be seen or available until uh, a future a future budget consideration. It's not immediately available. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, okay, uh, this slide is uh, just a reminder on board ordered restrictions on reserves. So again, this is back to the point I made earlier around the risk cap and the risk mitigation requirements in the rule. Um, the board or our, our board, the Green Mountain Care Board would want to take a look at the settlement policy and distribution of any savings earned um, that would likely go to reserves and the board would look at it, approve any distribution, um, and then those those dollars could be um, distributed to programs or providers um, based on that policy. This is consistent with past board orders. Um, in FY23, the order uh, restricts reserve, the use of reserves to additional funding for population health investment, financial backing <clears throat> for risk incurred by participating providers, maintaining ACO risk on behalf of participating providers, um, temporary cash flow issues associated with payer revenue delays and other uses pre-approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. And then there's also language uh, in the order that states that if one care uses its reserve, adjusts its participation fees, um, or uses its line of credit, it must notify the GMCB within 15 days of such use. Notification must include the reason for the change or any use authorized under this condition and a corresponding cash flow analysis. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to turn the next couple slides about the operating budget recommendation over to Matt Sutter from our finance team. Hey, can you all hear me fine? Great. Um, just to reorient to this table from uh, last week, I'll just um, explain it again quickly. So similar last week, we compared the operating expenses as budgeted to some historical ratios of operating costs to attributed lives. Um, in order to do this consistently, we converted to 20, 2023 dollars um, for determining the ratios. Um, so the budget impact columns can be understood as the cut necessary to reach that inflation adjusted ratio in that row. Um, like if I was going to read one out loud, the staff recommendation, which is number two, would be so in order to get to an $83.50 operating budget to attributed life ratio, um, which is the average of the last five years, one cares operating budget would need to be cut by 957,000 um, from submission. And uh, real quick, just if, sorry, if we could go back real quick, if you'll You'll notice that the dollar amounts have changed. They're slightly larger than they were last week. This is owing to an adjustment to the assumed 2024 inflation rate. In the prior model, we'd assumed 3.2% or 3.7%, excuse me, and uh, revised it down to 3.2, which is the most recent CPIU figures. Um, some other aspects of the operating budget we looked at um, include co executive compensation. It's unclear how bonuses are tied to organizational performance. Um, unclear if executive compensation is set relative to an appropriate benchmark. We're unclear if or how performance measure or return on investment is measured. Uh, we noticed a historic overestimate estimation of OPEX operating expenses in their budget compared to actuals. Um, looking from FY19 to 23, it's an average of about 1.25 million a year that was um, over budget and operating expenses. And then other areas for fiscal responsibility, we looked at and considered um, not well supported include marketing expenses. We saw in their submitted budget that they reported um, $661,000 for public affairs salary and benefit costs, um, $4.3 million for purchase services, which we know includes the um, additional analytics and um, $123,000 for supplies, occupancy, and other expenses. And finally, we have a table here kind of just illustrating over time how net assets have accumulated. Um, 
looking from 2018 on. Um, and then some key drivers of this. Obviously, their net assets will accumulate based on there's a revenue and a spending component of this. Um, but we wanted to focus largely on their their operating expense um, over budgeting for the last few years and, and how that can affect uh, or has affected their net assets over time. And as, as part of, um, um, so we can go to the next slide, apologies. And so our, our recommendation would be to, if for any of these oper cuts to operating expenses to reallocate to population health or primary care programs and have one care present on this, how they reallocated these funds in their uh, FY24 revised budget. And I think I can pass it back to Marissa now. Yeah, um, Michelle's actually going to walk through the con the conditions uh, consistent with previous years that we've gone over with some additions that have been made in the last week or so. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so as Marissa said, these on this slide and the next couple of slides should be pretty familiar to the board. Um, the bullets, their summaries, um, the order will include the full conditions, um, which are generally consistent with previous years. So first one, one care must submit reports and information in accordance with the GMCB reporting manual, which will be developed by staff early next year. One care must notify the Green Mountain Care Board of any material changes to their budget and explain the variance. One CARE's administrative expenses must not exceed the amount ordered by the Green Mountain Care Board. One CARE's administrative expenses must be less than the health care savings. One CARE must submit a revised budget by April 1st, 2024, and present on the revised budget in April 2024, uh, including final payer contracts, attribution by payer, a revised budget, hospital dues and risk, any changes to the risk model, and sources of funds for population health programs. One care must also notify the Green Mountain Care Board of any use of reserves or line of credit or any adjustment to participation fees. One care must notify the Green Mountain Care Board of any use of reserves or line of credit or any adjustments to participation fees. The use of reserves, additional participation fees, or funds drawn from the One Cares line of credit shall be limited to the following um, additional funding for population health investments, financial backing for risk incurred by participating providers, maintaining ACO wide risk on behalf of uh, participating providers, um, temporary cash flow issues associated with payer revenue delays, and any other pre approved uses by the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, the next one is that one care must implement the risk model as modified by the board with the requirement to, for one care to submit copies of contracts and a requirement to notify and seek approval from the Green Mountain Care Board as early as possible of any proposed changes to the risk model. The last couple ones. Um, the, uh, One Care must implement benchmark trend rates for payer contracts in alignment with the Green Mountain Care Board's decision on Medicare only ACO benchmark, uh, which you all just voted on. Uh, the Green Mountain Care Board's Medicaid advisory rate, rate case and for commercial payer contracts in alignment with ACO attributed population and the Green Mountain Care Board's approved rate filings. Um, also, One Care must engage in payer programs that qualify for APM scale to the greatest extent possible and align payer programs in key areas to the extent reasonable. And um, they also must explain any non scale qualifying programs and areas of misalignment. Uh, and we will require continued reporting on payer programs. Few more that are consistent with previous years. We expect that One Care will fund population health management and payer reform programs as detailed in the FY24 submission or as ordered by the board, and to notify the Green Mountain Care Board of any changes, including funding shortfalls, changes in program scope, 
and an analysis for each program line item as to whether and why the funding is appropriately scaled for attribution or some other factor. They must report evaluation results and evaluation focus areas for 2024 to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, they must fund the support and services or SASH program and blueprint for health payments to primary care practices and community health teams consistent with the amount approved by the Green Mountain Care Board in the Medicare ACO benchmark process, which you just voted on. And here are some updated um, or, um, or new uh, potential conditions. Uh, the ones that are in black um, may have some updated deliverables, but the intent behind the conditions does remain um, consistent with previous years. Um, One Care should work with Medicare Advantage plans operating in Vermont with a particular focus on Vermont-based plans offered by Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont and UVMMC, their MV MVP program. To develop skill qualifying programs, we just removed the, um, the time constraint around that. Second, uh, report FPP data and progress towards the goals as specified in the ACO reporting manual and FY24 guidance. Report on the CPR program, uh, and make some improvements to the benchmarking report, meaning the Medicare ACO um, benchmarking report that they have been submitting to us biannually. Um, the two updates would be that they include a statistical significance analysis in their next submission, which would be expected um, at about the same time we receive their FY24 revised budget. Um, and we would like to see um, them include the risk levels of all cohorts for each year in that report as well. The next few are um, new potential conditions for the board to consider. One care to submit accumulated net asset statements from 2018 to 2023 actuals annually, um, or alternatively, we could adapt the sources and uses table um, to fulfill this purpose as well. The second would be for One Care to reconcile PHM payments after year end, um, and they can we can get that information through a year end sources and uses Q4 reporting, or we could put that in in guidance. And finally, um, we would want One Care to verify to the Green Mountain Care Board that payments for primary care are being used to support primary care consistent with 18 VSA 9382B1G. And um, how we go about that is up for discussion. I will hand it back over to Russ to walk us through some potential motion language. Um, thanks. Uh, Michelle, so <clears throat> um, it seemed like there were a couple of decision points here for the board and the best way. Um, so there are going to be a couple of motions to uh, if the board wants to address all those decision points. So it seemed like the best way to do that was we have some potential motion language for modification of the Medicare risk corridor, um, some potential motion language for modification of the operating budget. And then on the next slide, some potential modification uh, motion language for approval of the modified budget with the other uh, conditions that Michelle just walked through. Um, so it seemed like it would make the most sense for the or to kind of take these in order, if uh, that makes sense to the board members also. And Russ, sorry, was there one more page of potential motion language? Oh. Got it. Okay. Could could you go back to the 24, please? Okay, is there anything else from the staff at this time? 
No, we turn it over to you. Great, thank you. All right, I'll open it up to the board for any questions or comments anyone may have. Can I just start with a procedural question, Russ? Was your intention uh, that we work through these one at a time, or Owen, or do you, or are you thinking discuss and then go from there? Um, it might make, so the way I'll do it is if you just have any board members have questions or comments, I'll sort of keep track of where people are on these issues. And obviously you may have other comments relating to other things, but if you can in any comments you may have suggest any thoughts you might have on what was put up or where you might want to do something differently. And then it'll give me information as to whether or not we need a roll call or whether or not we can have a motion on these um, suggestions or, or different motions. And I think just for timing purposes, um, ideally we'd be able to get through um, a vote today. We could come back and do it later, although I think if there's significant changes, it's it's more difficult on one care with their contracting with hospitals and getting to an agreement with Medicare and signing an agreement. And um, so hopefully we can get through it all today. And don't all jump up, but um, I guess I'll go. I'll go first with a couple of thoughts that I have since I have the mic unmuted. Um, there's a lot of positives in One Care's budget this year. There are some improvements that I think were really important that we had hoped for and we wanted to see. Um, a couple that stuck out to me that I'll share was that they increased the bonus pool. I thought that was a positive. We want to see more risk we want to see higher bonus levels we want to see financial inducements that cause providers to to make the changes that we want to support our health care reform efforts um, they also hit some of the key guidance terms um, the one that stuck out to me was i think it was number nine where they're targeting specific areas for improvement i like the ones they selected those are really great ones i think it's ed utilization wellness visits and primary care visits. So I thought that was an appropriate place to target for improvement, and that was a positive. Um, a couple things I was concerned about with the budget was that we haven't seen programmatic impact on a lot of the programs. Um, certainly there's significantly significant support for the CPR program and a lot of value there. It's a program that I really support, and I'm glad it's continuing in a, in a healthy fashion. Um, there wasn't showing of significant increase in quality caused by um, programmatic efforts. And uh, there was a lack of support for um, the administrative costs, uh, particularly relating to compensation, which we had hoped to get, but that wasn't able to happen. Um, and there, in my view, is insufficient support for primary care overall. We have seen the primary care benchmarking data and it hasn't been on the right trend line. And that's a huge crux of the program. I know it's an effort that, an area where One Care wants to really improve. Um, and I think this gives them an opportunity to do so, the staff recommendation. Um, I think moving more money towards primary care is part of what we were trying to do with this reform. It's a statutory requirement. I know it's something that One Care cares about. So I supported that uh, concept. Um, I think it's really all I had. I, I support the staff's recommendation, all three of them. I support moving to a higher level of risk from 3% to 4% programs based on risk. Risk is how we're trying to incentivize and change behavior for the benefit of Vermonters, providers, and patients. Um, this will allow us to have more money potentially brought in from Medicare for the state. And I think Ms. Sawyer showed us a presentation with the amount of money that was, quote, left on the table from lower risk levels in the past. 
Um, the target that we set today is the highest level of target we could set for Medicare. So it's actually the most favorable to achieve those savings with this level of risk. So I think that's beneficial. And I thought it was relevant, the point about how much money had been over budgeted um, historically, um, that there was, I forget the exact numbers, but it was around a million or so each year operating budget that was projected that was um, not necessary in the end. And so this recommendation sort of aligns with that amount. Uh, and I don't think it causes too much disruption and it allows for uh, one care to uh, take on that additional risk. So I support the staff recommendation. I guess I can go. Um... I, I agree a lot with uh, most of Owen's uh, discussion points regarding the things that he's impressed with One Care this year uh, and some improvements. I think I just want to just definitely echo the CPR program and also the work with Diva on uh, having a fee a fixed perspective payment Medicaid uh, program for the state. It's it's the most um, extensive payment reform. Uh, initiative that's occurred through the all payer model. And so um, I think that's an important thing to call out. Um, I also in agreement with a 4% risk corridor. I think this, um, again, I, all, all, the, the risk incentivizes um, higher performance. That's the point of having the risk on the downside. And it also allows for um, greater rewards on the upside and generally speaking, many years there would have been far greater rewards had a higher risk corridor been chosen. Um, with regarding supporting primary care population health programs with money from the operating expenses, I I actually could could go further than than the staff recommendation. Uh, I think I was just about at the staff recommendation before realizing the over budgeting of 1.25 million on average. Um, so roughly speaking, I would be comfortable with 2.25 million. Uh, I think that could be justified in multiple ways, but I think that one care reached its optimal staffing, I think, or complete staffing in 2018, as reported last year, I believe. And that was a very different one care, uh, you know, uh, developing a statewide payment reform model. Now we're a co coalition of the willing so I would expect One Care's operating expenses to continue to reduce uh, over the next several years unless there is some new development in uh, payment reform that it is involved with. So I would be comfortable with um, moving more along the line of $2.25 million to improve primary care programs uh, in Vermont and uh, take that from One Care's operating expenses. This is uh, Tom, I don't mind going next. Um, <clears throat> so I was thinking about this meeting, I, I tried to reflect on what is meant by regulation, right? We talk about systems and processes and budgets and kind of, it's easy to lose sight of the idea that regulation is a process that's meant to give the public and policymakers peace of mind that we are working to make sure the policies that have been enacted improve and safeguard public well-being, and that they're working as intended, living up to their promises, avoiding harm, and that we're monitoring for unintended consequences. Over the past uh, couple years of presentations, um, it's become more and more clear to me that One Care has not been able to live up to its promises. And while we just had 14 public comments this go around about One Care's budget, we had dozens more in the um, comments about ACOs in general just a few months ago. And we've got to be over hundreds in the past couple years about One Care's performance and the lack, its lack of 
improving the well-being of Vermonters. And so I, I, I understand people are frustrated that Vermonters, these are our friends and families who we've been, healthcare has been reforming in Vermont, um, but their premiums have been going up so high that um, their premiums and deductibles are so high, it, you fear getting sick or being injured. Right. Now, this isn't one care's fault, but one care was enacted to try to change that trajectory, and it hasn't worked. But we're now in a system, we're now in a situation where we keep talking about propping up this inefficient, ineffective organization because we need it in order for federal money to come into our healthcare system. We're perpetuating a failing organization to support organizations that can do good, like Blueprint. That's a bad system. And continuing to, fu to fund it as if it is working or as if it might work in just a little bit more time if we keep giving it money, that's wasteful. And I'm uncomfortable as a regulator continuing to do that. So I think it's at a minimum increasing the risk corridor to 4% I support. And I think the operating budget can be cut by at least $4 million and that money moved to more effective programs. And I say that based not just on the, the totality of the budget information that we've reviewed over the weeks, but specifically today, um, we've, Additionally, learned that one care has regularly, not necessarily on purpose, but over budgeted their operating expenses by 1.25 million on average. So, if we went with the most extreme position in the chart that was shown, 4.3 million, but remove the 1.25, we're talking about a $3 million difference roughly. And if we then look at Slide 16, there's way more than $3 million on that slide. There's also, because of the over budgeting over years, there's 8 million in the coffers. So I understand that we're uncomfortable making a big change, but I'm uncomfortable continuing to do small things when this organization has not lived up to its promises or plans, I realize that disrupting it completely would destabilize other aspects of the system. And that's what I meant earlier when I said, we're propping up a failing organization because it brings money in for organizations that do good. That money that was coming in, that has been coming in, was meant to help organizations in our state transform to risk-bearing entities. That's a fundamental feature of alternative payment models. But that money that's come in hasn't been used to transform. It's turned into funding to sustaining those organizations. The system is, is not working. But if we remove one care, we harm things that are working. And I said last week, the best analogy that I can come up with is that as a state, we've launched a plane with Verm all Vermonters on it in hopes of improving healthcare. And it had trouble lifting off. And there have been repeated and and frequent malfunctions. It's not going to make it where we wanted it to go. So it'd be irresponsible to shoot it down or to somehow crash it. So we have to find a way to get it back safely. And we need to learn from what's happened over the years of this and make sure we don't do it again. 
to the best of our ability. That because it's failed, that's a lot of things in healthcare reform fail, right? It's because our efforts are designed by humans and implemented by humans in the complex systems. So the fact that it's failed and publicly saying that it's failed is not necessarily a problem. The problem is if we don't recognize it as such and keep doing what we've been doing. So I'm, I think it's important to increase the risk corridor to at least four. And I think it would be wise of us to recognize the struggles that have come upon Vermonters and the inefficient way and ineffective way that One Care has shown its ability to, to address those and reduce its operating expenses as to the four by 4.3 and move that to primary care and public health programs. I don't think it'd be smart to do more because it could risk, it could destabilize the system too much. But the figures that have been shown to us throughout this budget process, I think support my argument. And I can understand that it's uncomfortable for people to think about $4.3 million, but I, I, I ask that you look at those numbers and consider that as a possibility when we vote. Thank you, Chair. Well, the Chair, I think you've got your work cut out for you today. <laughs> um, in the sense of, I think we're, we're all in different places. Um, first of all, to the staff. I mean, I know that this has been, the last few weeks have been challenging in trying to come up with um, some recommendations and some options for the board. And I, and I know how much work has gone into this and the evolution, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I also wanna echo some of Owen's comments and, and, and Dave, some of Dave's comments about some of the efforts that I've seen the ACO make um in the budget and the evolution of the budgets over time um i i really appreciate the increased provider accountability that i see and shifting some of the uh, population health payments and the incentives you know out of the base into the bonus very much appreciated that i think that's the right direction um the cpr program has been proven you know to be one of the uh, gems of this organization. I think it's very much appreciated by the independent, pro independent provider network, and um, I'm glad that there's a continued investment in that program. And I do also want to acknowledge, um, I think we should acknowledge the efforts the ACO made to meet the board's benchmarks that we set forth in the guidance. I, I recognize that, I appreciate that, and I want to note that. Um, in terms of where I'm landing uh, on these recommendations, um, I, I do support the, the staff's recommendation to increase the Medicare risk corridor for the reasons that have been outlined. I don't wanna reiterate them, but um, I think drawing down more federal dollars, uh, increasing risk over time, we set that in guidance. It was one of our uh, you know, guidance requirements. They would take more risk. I think having the ACO take some accountability makes sense and seeing their reserves, I'm not too worried about where those dollars would come from. And I'm hopeful that if the ACO takes some risk, uh, that they will you know, be thinking, <laughs> they're having them having some accountability will increase some of the ways in which they think about reallocating potentially uh, their budget to ensure that they actually make those savings. Um, so, with regard to the second, so I support um, increasing the risk quarter from three to four percent. With respect to the modification of the operating budget, um, you know, I do think that one of the criteria that we have to consider is administrative costs. And I think while the ACO met the benchmark set in guidance, um, you know, the consistent over budgeting that we see is gives me pause. And it's been an average of about you know one point three million dollars since two thousand nineteen. If you include two thousand eighteen, it's about eight hundred and thirty four thousand dollars per year of of over budgeting. So there is some the, there is some um, buffer 
in the budget that's been submitted here. And given that we're facing some significant primary care shortages and the ACO has to some degree and the network, I should say, has you know, to some degree fallen short of expectations in some areas that I do believe could be improved with some population health investments and investments in primary care, I can support the staff's recommendation to reallocate um, some of the operating budget towards population health programs and primary care. But I'm at the staff's recommendation um, of the 957,000. That's in the range of what the ACO has typically over budgeted for operating expenses. So that's where my comfort is in terms of that. I think um, increasing it higher than that, I appreciate everybody's points and the concerns, but I wanna recognize that we're asking the ACO to take additional risk, right? So we're putting more risk on the ACO. Um, and so they're gonna be accountable for that. They're gonna need to, you know, ensure that their data analytics are strong. They're going to need to ensure that their care management programs are strong. They're going to need to ensure they're going to need to up their game, right, to take on this additional risk. So shifting more out of the operating budget to me seems like a bridge too far at this point. So I would support the staff's recommendation. I can see where those dollars can come from, whether it be in the conservative budgeting that we've seen in the past or whether it's taken out of some reserves or whether you know, you look towards bonuses or um, marketing public, you know, public affairs budget that may not, you know, the public affairs budget may not have a direct relationship to population health outcomes in ways that other programs might. So that's where I'm at um, in the recommendations, and I support the conditions that uh, Russ went through as well. I was considering not saying anything for a change, but um, given where folks are, I feel like I should probably say something so the chair has a sense of where I'm at. Uh, my decisions on the motions today are based on the guidance and the guidance targets that we set forth. In the guidance, we indicated that, quote, for all budget targets that are met, the ACO, ACO should expect less analysis of this area of the budget from the GMCB and staff. So I am following the guidance that we set forth earlier. So I'll just cut to the chase. I'm supportive of the first staff recommendation to increase the risk quarter, and I will vote no on the second. Um, it seems like um, I didn't hear any other concerns about the standard conditions. So. Um, unless there's a, uh, doesn't look like there's any concerns on that. So <clears throat> by my notes, it looks like there's generally pretty good support from the board on the risk recommendation and on the standard conditions, and then on the whether or not to uh, accept a budget that includes a smaller amount for admin and an increased amount for PHM or primary care. There's a bit of a split. Um, <clears throat> sounds like Jess and I are sort of in the same position. Tom and Dave may be a little bit higher, and Robin may be a little bit lower. Um, I think everyone, frankly, in my view, made really good points. I can understand all of them, frankly, and they, all of them have some appeal to me. Um, and this is not easy. I think. <clears throat> to Robin's point about the um, guidance, uh, my personal view is that the guidance is something we are to look at. It's one of the factors that we look at. There's, of course, any number of things that happen during the course of the year that we couldn't anticipate in guidance. And I take the guidance as um, uh, in totality uh, rather than piecemeal. Um, so on the guidance, I think it would be more comfortable for myself and probably for others as well if there's an interest in a larger reduction that perhaps we should do a more thorough job in the guidance to indicate that uh, in the future, whereas this year's guidance wasn't as prescriptive, although there was a couple benchmarks that were left open because we didn't have the data. Um, the other financial points that I wrote down were 
the unsupported executive compensation and I think rather unsupported marketing, PR, branding buckets, whatever. I forget the exact terminology, but I had 410 on one and 661 on the other. Um, and then the over budgeting of a million two or whatever it was. So I can certainly understand where Dave is. And I think if you take a really hard look at sort of the broader returns and impact, I can certainly understand where Tom is as well. So I can see why that we're a little bit split. I think one question I have is, so on the 2.25 million uh, adjustment that Dave mentioned, can you explain a little bit more, Dave, of why you see that as the appropriate number? Yeah, I I came to that number um, with the idea that uh, the executive bonuses and the marketing money probably would do better reallocated for primary care, given that we don't really have any information uh, supporting the executive salaries, executive bonuses, and the metrics used for bonuses last year seemed um, not really specific and measurable for improving quality or decreasing cost of care in Vermont. Uh, and then I was additive with that and the 1.25 over budget. Historically. I understand that logic completely. And I think if I were looking at sort of what I view as the kind of broader results, I can understand it. I guess just to respond to that, my hesitation is a little bit about the disruption, the unknown, all those types of things, right? Like, and, and I, I recognize when we say yes to things, there's all these other unintended things that happen or don't happen that we don't know. And when we say no to things, it's the same dynamic. We don't know what this will change. Um, will it make it impossible? for them to achieve like we want them to achieve, or is it just making it more cost effective and they are still able to achieve? And I don't really have a great sense of that. So I guess maybe part of it's being a little conservative myself. I guess the response to that, I part of my view is that I want them to achieve. And by putting this money where I mean, there's not a whole lot of money in the CPR program compared to their overall operating expenses. The amount of the amount of impact this could make in those what 19 practices. I don't know how many providers. I don't know how many thousands, tens of thousands of patients that covers is is pretty impressive. But I do agree that I don't want to. Um, I'm trying to be mindful of not disrupting the organization of one care because of so many of the things that we've talked about that we really want a thriving ACO in Vermont. I mean, that's that's still the goal and one care's importance in so many of the programs in Vermont. So I I could see I mean, I I, I could see being at a lower number and just being very thorough in the guidance coming up this following year with the expectation of probably even a larger number and less completely justified within the budget. Of course, if the guidance had, if the budget submitted next year had some transformative program that was really going to show a significant return to Vermonters on their investment, then I would be supportive of not reducing the budget then. But I could, I, you know, I, I think we're at a transition of the role of one care in Vermont's health landscape. So, so, so I could, I could see being in that position. I'd, I'd be comfortable with that. I think it, 
it's palpable, right? The the discomfort and 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 tension that that we're experiencing. Um, and to go back to the analogy with the plane, we've got to figure out a way to to keep it in the air. Um, I said last year, and and Dave's comments reminded me of it. When an organization is is struggling, the general consensus it, on advice to it from a consulting standpoint is to identify the essential functions and strip everything else and keep just the essential functions and do it really, really well. Then try to rebuild. And as far as I can tell, the essential that One Care serves is as the receiver of the federal dollars and distribute, it's a pass through organization. Now, because of the way they do their budget, I have not over the past few years been able to identify how much it costs to be a pass through organization. So the 4.3 may be high. Doing nothing is unacceptable to me personally. And I think the lower figures that we've been talking about don't recognize that we're not taking money out of healthcare with this decision. We're redistributing. We're moving money out of administrative expenses and potentially moving it into programs that have demonstrated effectiveness. And I'm struggling with our reluctance to do that. So I'm not stuck at 4.3 by any means, because I don't know that we can arrive at a perfectly identified number. So I'm open to compromise. And I appreciate you listening to my arguments. Um, let's do two things. And I, I think there's some staff and folks that have hard stops today, and I want to be mindful of that. I think I think it's around 4.30 um, that we have a hard stop, I think. Why don't we take up what seems as though we can agree upon at this time, which is the first motion and the last motion. And um, I think after that, since we published the motions, the motion language, and I guess we're not sure which if we're going to make the second motion or not, um, but perhaps we can take some public comment uh, and that might assist us in thinking about these uh, issues. Um, Russ, if I take public comment now on the motion that's that's published, the second motion, do I need to take another round of public comment if that's the same motion that ultimately gets made or if I do, if it ends up being a different motion? You know, let me do this, Russ. That's probably that's probably legal advice. Let me let me just do this. I'll I'll ask for public comment as to what we we're working on, and I can ask you that question in the break. <clears throat> so, uh, I move to modify One Care Vermont's fiscal year 24 budget by requiring One Care to increase its Medicare risk corridor from three to four percent, with One Care Vermont holding the additional risk of shared losses, using its net assets as risk mitigation and for one care to update its settlement policy to reflect additional potential upside consistent with the board's discussion today. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Oh, wait, sorry, um, sorry, I, I forgot. Yeah, you got me, Russ. Um, thank you for the second, Robin, and I will turn into the healthcare advocate for any comment on that motion. Nothing from us, Chair Foster. All right. And Mr. Berman, the CEO of OneCare, do you have any comment on that motion? I do. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. The Vermont All Pair model specified that the Green Mountain Care Board work in collaboration with Vermont ACOs to achieve the goals set forth in the agreement. 
feel sometimes from the discussion that's going on here, we've lost some sight of what those goals are, but I'll get back to that. It makes sense that our shared desires for the ACO to partner with local healthcare providers to transform Vermont's healthcare system from a traditional uncoordinated confederacy to a collaborative ecosystem that focuses on health goals by providing actionable data and innovative payments that foster better outcomes for all. I think our common vision is to create a trusted, equitable healthcare system where patients and providers work together to achieve optimal health and exceptional healthcare experience for everyone in the state. I'd say in the spirit of partnership and vision, we created a 2024 budget that meets the operating budget requirements and guidance that were outlined by all of you earlier in the summer. I'm, I'm really concerned with what's going on now because the changes you're proposing are moving those goalposts out further. The guidance issued over the summer stated that the ratio of operating expenses to PHM payment reform payments, including the FPP and budgeted bonus payments, must not exceed the five-year average of 3.25%, and that the ratio of population health management funding to the number of attributed lives must be at a minimum the FY23 revised budget amount. I think you'll all agree that in our submitted budget, we reduced the operating expenses in 2024 to comply with that guidance. The GMBC staff verified that we met that criteria with a 3.14% ratio. So said another way, we met your requirements and now you're asking that we adjust our budget based on different previously unknown criteria and to make changes that are not based on any other established criteria. I just wanna be clear that for one care, cutting the operating budget means losing essential resources needed to fulfill the strategic objectives set forth by our board of managers. Further, while drastically reducing our funding, or at least proposing that, you're at the same time asking us to hold more risk centrally. We weren't designed to do that. We were designed to bring healthcare providers and hospitals of all stripes together to participate in value-based healthcare contracts that seek to facilitate improved provider network performance and higher value, how, <clears throat> pardon me, higher value for Vermonters. Going back to our founding 10 years ago or more, one care was simply just not designed to hold significant risk and doing so is not consistent with the model that's been in place from before the APM even existed. We are in, in a sense, a network of the providers and specifically the hospitals that take risk on behalf of their communities. Placing too much risk centrally on, a, on the statewide ACO as opposed to allowing it to function as designed and place risk within each healthcare service area is contrary to the entire concept behind creating accountable communities. Further, it's moving accountability in the opposite direction of the path that the state of Vermont would like to transition towards in 26 with the AHEAD model. In that model, risk is gonna be held at the provider level due to the required hospital global budgets. So we'll be going backwards from that. Lastly, you're simultaneously ordering us to increase the risk corridor with Medicare, even though you've stated that this decision-making authority rests with the ACO. I just say, while you appear to be really focused on the amount of money that OneCare might be leaving on the table, if we don't increase that risk corridor, I encourage you to consider the very real possibility of downside risk. We anticipate that the utilization may actually increase in 24 when compared to the prior year as hospitals seek to address the pent-up demand for services in the post-pandemic era, which I think you pointed out in the hospital budget process. Just saying in closing, we're really proud of the collaborative entity that we've built. We remain committed to supporting our participant network, in particularly primary care. We agree with you, that is very important. That's why we've built the programs we have and we wanna scale them up and really harness the performance in 24. On the subject of risk, we'll consider how we can comply with those orders. I think we might be able to do it. But with regard to us operating below budget in past years, I think it's really important for you to note that a lot of those years were during the pandemic era and those budget shortfalls or, or uh, surpluses were due to staffing vacancies. That was common across the United States, just as people were rampantly over budget as they tried to supply things that weren't previously needed before the pandemic. And I want to be clear that we've already addressed that by reducing the budget in 2024 substantially. So if you move those goalposts out further with regard to our operating budget, it's really going to cause problems. And we ask you to reconsider these budget orders and do the right thing for the healthcare system of Vermonters and approve the operating budget as submitted. We can work with you on the risk front, but I, I want you to be really thoughtful about what it's like when you're asking us to take increased risk and try to get these programs 
scaled up to the level you're asking and drastically cutting our funding at the same time and whether that's really the right thing to do. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to comment and I appreciate this is a difficult decision. I thank you for your thoughtful approach to it. Thank you for your comment. Is there any other public comment? Okay. Um, all of those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And the motion carries unanimously. Um, could you put up the third? Proposed motion language. I move. To, sorry, go ahead, Russ. Mm -hmm. Sorry, before you do that, the motions that were set out were kind of contemplated sequentially. <clears throat> so, um, I, if you think that the board is coming back to the second motion, you may want to adjust this motion to just approve the conditions, the other conditions. Uh, I see. And not, yeah, and I not see. have it. And cause this was kind of meant to be kind of a summation of the whole, um, of the whole. And, and so you may want to um, save that for the end. I see. Um, Can I ask a quick question? I'm sorry, Owen. Um, no, are there any con are there any conditions that are tied to the cut in the operating expenses that should not be voted on prior to that motion being approved or disapproved? Um, so I think there are a couple of conditions that say as that refer to operating expenses as adjusted by the board. Um, I, <clears throat> you know, I'm. I think I would have to go back and flip through those slides to be able to answer that question completely. Let's um, let's do this, Russ. I go back to the go back. Just I want to keep an eye on the time, and I'd really love to be able to hopefully get this done so that one care can take the next steps if there are any. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this motion. I'll see if there's a second, and then we can take any additional public comment, and maybe that helps us think about it. So I'll move to modify one care of Vermont's fiscal year 24 budget by reducing operating expenses by, um, I forget the exact amount, the amount recommended in the staff recommendation in the $900,000 range and requiring one care to instead reallocate that amount to population health and primary care programs that will achieve the best return on investment consistent with the board's discussion today. I will second it. And is there any public comment on the motion? Uh, Mr. Boris, um, the CFO of One Care, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair Foster. Good afternoon, everybody. I just want to comment quickly on the kind of over budgeting theme from today and a little bit of context and color, uh, if I may. So, uh, One Care was formed in 2012 by providers to help create an efficient platform to enter into value based care uh, arrangements. That's the direction the industry is headed. and and having one central organization to offer this service to providers in Vermont and New Hampshire as well uh, makes a lot of sense. It still does today, uh, over 10 years later. Um, we work very collaboratively with our provider organizations and particularly the hospitals that fund us to develop a budget every year. And um, really, I think what's been characterized as over budgeting this year to me is actually sound expense management. We develop a plan at the beginning of the year and as, as one care, uh, finance leader, it's my job to make sure that we are using the funds they 
offered to us efficiently. And if we have an expense that we don't think we critically need for a year, uh, we will shelve it. Additionally, I also think it's important to note that through the pandemic, business was disrupted for many people and organizations, and OneCare was no exception. We transitioned from a highly active workplace with a lot of travel to a lot of organizations across the state, which in many ways is was great, to a remote structure. And through many of those years, we did not know whether or not we would revert to a, a full in-person model again. And as the pandemic lingered on and on, we decided at one point to make a decision to shrink our office space and really just adopt the remote structure uh, over the long haul. And that's the way we continue to operate today. So some of the characteriz characterizations of over budgeting are really more a factor of what happened to our world and how we operate collaboratively with our hospital funders. I'll also note that at the conclusion of every year, we present to the One Care Finance Committee and the board the results from the, from the budget year. And we analyze and show them a presentation of here's what we budgeted and expect us, expected to spend relative to what we actually spent during the year. And we we ask of them, what's your preference? Is it to retain those earnings at One Care to Vermont to build reserves uh, so that we could potentially hold the risk that's being contemplated here today or return the funds back to our funding hospitals? So I, I just think it's important to note that this is a, a very collaborative arrangement that we have with our hospitals to make sure that One Care is a, a good and sound steward of the funds uh, made available to us by them to support value-based care programming across Vermont. And to echo Abe's comments, I think there's a real paradox between asking the organization to take on more risk, which as he said, I think we can work with in some ways while also reducing the resources. We're a small business in Vermont. We don't have a, a huge staffing workforce to be able to integrate into every practice and organization across the state. Uh, so it's a really careful balance to take on more organizational risk with fewer and fewer resources. And again, we just like to make the point we complied with the budget guidance intentionally. That was very intentional on my part through the budget development process. And I urge the board to really think carefully about their decision on this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rader Wallach, and I've been asked to introduce people if they're associated with a regulated entity. So I believe you're still the chair of One Care, but I don't know for certain. And I hope you're doing well. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, I'm here as the chair of the One Care board. Um, and also as somebody who's been involved with One Care uh, basically since its inception. And uh, One Care was created. Um, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, federal law. Uh, it was organized under federal law to have a broadly representative board as is required, uh, including having um, a diverse array of consumer representatives on our board. Um, that board takes, we take our job very seriously and we review annually both the budget and the operations of the organization and the goals that we set as an organization. Uh, and in fact, just voted at our last meeting last week on uh, strategic goals for the coming year. And I think you'll see reflected in those strategic goals for the coming year, precisely the kind of uh, enhanced focus on core capabilities uh, and uh, efficiencies that some of the board members have been talking about here today. Um, but I want to I want to first emphasize that uh, we're a private organization organized under federal law. Uh, no other ACO in the country is regulated the way that uh, we are. Um, and um, I want to suggest that uh, this is one tool in the state's toolbox um, and one way that we can achieve the lofty goals that we set out to achieve uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but it's not the entirety of the Green Mountain Care Board's job and uh, it's not the entirety of One Care's job to achieve healthcare reform on behalf of Vermont. And so focusing on the um success or failure of one care i think is kind of uh taking your eyes off the ball in some ways 
um, in terms of what the overall goal of healthcare reform is. And I challenge you to find a place in the country where anyone's done better. Um, One Care has not been successful in all of its endeavors, but it's been it's been a great thing in Vermont. It's achieved a lot, and um, and so I think it's it's sort of unfair to uh, to equate One Care's achievements with has has Vermont achieved healthcare reform or not? Has Vermont achieved um, something that nobody else in the country or frankly in the world has achieved? So that's just one one um, point I wanted to make. In terms of risk, um, One Care, uh, as uh, both Abe and Tom have stated, was never meant to be a risk-bearing entity. It was meant to be a means of aggregating risk so that providers in Vermont who are small and financially fragile um, could assume some risk, but not too much. Not so much that it would imperil their financial health and risk them going under uh, in communities that depended on their services. Um, But the idea was always to pass through risk to providers because that is the fundamental concept uh, underlying the organization, that providers should assume risk should have some financial risk for the cost and quality of the care they provide so that they'll try to improve on both of those fronts. So the idea that you you hold that at a corporate level and don't pass that through to providers just is kind of antithetical to the whole underlying concept. And as Abe mentioned, also seems inconsistent with where the federal government is going in terms of their next model. Um, I think that's about all I'd like to say, except that I think as we enter into the next phase of the all-payer model where we have to analyze what is, what are the federal, what is the federal government proposing and what's the potential impact on Vermont and Vermont's healthcare providers. I think one of the only sources of really good knowledge about this and one of the only places where providers will be able to get together and discuss this and uh, and shed light on, is this a good deal or not, is it one care? Um, so I hope that um, you don't discount that value, the fact that one care pulls providers together to discuss these things and to aggregate the knowledge of the folks who actually are on the ground, receiving money, taking risk, providing services about the impact of these models. Um, And then last thing is, I think, um, in terms of getting into the operational budget, I just think you're out of bounds. Uh, That's the only way I can put it. Um, I think uh, we complied. The board of One Care reviewed the budget. Uh, We complied with your budget guidance. And for you to go beyond that and say, as as Abe said, that you're going to now move the goalpost is uh, not fair play um, and also makes me question why is there a board of directors of One Care if you're going to get into kind of line item uh, editing of our budget. Thank you and uh, I appreciate your time. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment on the motion? Okay, why don't we take just a, we'll take a three minute break. Oh, sorry, I'm Sam, I'll turn to you. I, I, I'm i sorry to have not called on you. Please go ahead. No worries. And I apologize that I've not turned on lights in my house. Um, I'm not broadcasting from a dungeon. Um, I just wanted to say that we support uh, the motion that the staff recommendation uh, that was proposed. And I think the board knows where we stand. I mean, obviously we submitted an extensive public comment, so I won't resummarize that, um, but just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for submitting a comment. 
Um, any other public comment? Okay, um, we have a little bit of scheduling things to deal with, and um, I'll take a I'll take a five minute break till four twenty seven. We'll come back at four twenty seven. Thank you. Okay, I think we can resume. Um, and we made a couple adjustments. I think a couple of folks can stay a little bit longer. So we can see if we can resolve this today or not. And uh, we've checked some calendars. We should um, have a little more time. Um, so I don't know if any other board members have any other thoughts they want to share, um, but I'll open it up in the event that there is. Uh, I just want to ask the staff a question. Um, Mr. Berman mentioned a substantial reduction in operating budget in 2024. Can you comment if there was a substantial reduction in the operating budget in 2024? My memory is there's actually a little increase compared to 2023. No, you're muted. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I was double muted. Um, I did look at this. I don't have the slide in front of me. Um, maybe Matt can pull it up or we can get it. But my understanding from the one care hearing on November 8th is that they presented a budgeted to budgeted look, and that is a decrease um, in their operating budget. We looked at an actual to a budgeted. So their actuals for 23 projected to their budgeted 24 is an increase. Okay. I, the ad, that, exact numbers I don't have in front of me. Okay. That that's helpful. That's helpful. Um, my my only other comment is, I think that sometimes we, you know, there's questions about what the board's role is in evaluating one care specifically. It seems to come up, and my impression. Of the funding from of one care is that uh, there's basically a pass through from Vermonters or people who are paying for health care on behalf of Vermonters, commercial rate payers, federal payers, state payers. And I guess if you one care does mention the cost shift, so it would be commercial rate payers have a pass through hospitals to one care for their operating budget. So while hospitals allocate that money to one care, it is really Vermonters money that's going to one care. And I, and I think that that when I think about evaluating one cares budget, I think about our responsibility as a board to ensure that Vermonters money is being spent in the most optimal way. To meet the goals of improved access, improve quality, reduce cost, improve equity, those those things. So that's just my my one my one comment on that. But thank you, Marissa, for that clarification. Any other board members have any questions or thoughts? Right. Um, so, you know, I, I think the folks with the public comments were really helpful in sharing their views. And I think, you know, one of them was similar with what member Lund had said. And I think there is, it is more comfortable to think of it that way as an opportunity to put some of this more in guidance next year to be more prescriptive. I know the board had asked, or I think Dr. Merman had asked, or staff had asked for programmatic costs. And what I'm hearing from Dave and Tom is that you have concerns that this costs more than what it needs to. Some of these programs aren't working and we're paying for them, and you have an obligation to take care and be responsible stewards of that money in this role. And I understand that completely. Um, I think maybe what we could do is put in guidance next year that we need to understand those programmatic costs better and to have a better ROI on the programs. What is working and what is not working? I, I don't know if it's so binary as, you know, pass through versus not pass through versus has all these programs that help really uh, help care for Vermonters in significant ways. But I think we need to kind of drill down on that a little bit before 
I think we should make a very large reduction. I think we need to understand that before we do. And I think the right place to do that at this time would really be in guidance. I think there is over budgeting. I mean, it's over budgeted every year, whether it's a pandemic or not, it's more. The guidance isn't binding. There's a whole host of factors out there that are important for us to consider beyond the guidance, including the statutory factors. I had concerns about, <clears throat> frankly, um, uh, some of the administrative costs, but also uh, the resources for primary care and some of the public comment that was shared and also B1D and some of what we saw in some of the um, claims regarding savings. I had concerns about some of that. So I would ask the board members to consider this more measured and moderate reduction at this time, and that we can take a really hard look at what's more appropriate next year. So I think what I'll do in the interest of time, I do want one care to have a decision today, if we can, is I'm gonna ask Russ to take a roll call vote. And I ask you guys to think about this. <clears throat> and um, if we can't get it, we can't get it. Go ahead, Tom. Um, before we vote, can would you please remind me the wording of what we're voting on specifically? Yeah, I don't know if Marissa, you have that. Marissa, do you have the um? I wrote it down somewhere, but the the actual dollar amount that was put up in the recommendation. I believe it's nine hundred and fifty seven thousand dollars. Yeah, I can I can go back to a previous slide. OK, well, while you do that, um, Chair, I just wanted to say that I. Um, I understand your position and what you've just said, and I am willing to compromise. Um, there were in the in the public comments some comments made about um, asking to increase risk while decreasing budget, and that um, that created some discomfort. Um, I like what you've mentioned about trying to help programmatically um, figure out how much it costs to do different things, because on slide 16, there was nothing mentioned about risk bearing tolerance being part of those budgeted items, talking about executive salaries, um, marketing, et cetera, purchased services. Um, so it's difficult for me to just accept that argument that increasing risk while decreasing the budget is um, an impossible ask. Um, without knowing what is needed to take more risk. So um, I like the approach that you've um, that you outlined a moment ago, where we could understand with a little bit more detail what's needed to take more risk, what's needed to deliver these programs, what's needed to um, fulfill the pass through what I think of as the essential component of the ACO. Um, and I'd also like to say that I, I, some board members um, noted that they want this to succeed. Um, I'm one of those. I'd like this. I'd like this reform effort to work. So um, with that, I'll pass back to you. Yeah, I guess I would just say in response that uh, I. Any vote I make on any of these things is so that it works and that it succeeds. And and that's, I think, the goal. Um, OK, so Russ, I think you can take a roll call vote with, I didn't have the exact numbers when I made the motion, but it was $957,245. Um, okay, I'll do a roll call vote on that motion in alphabetical order. Uh, so, <clears throat> board member Holmes? Yes. Uh, board member Lunge? No. Board member Merman? 
Yes. Uh, board member Walsh. Yes. Uh, and Chair Foster. Yes. Okay. Um, can you go to the other motion? I move to approve one care Vermont fiscal year 24 budget as modified today by the Green Mountain Care Board and subject to the conditions presented today by GMCB staff. I'll second. second. And sorry, did we have any additions or modifications that I need to flag for us? Uh, I don't believe so. Um, Marissa, jump in if I'm wrong. But I don't think there were. I, I think this, the way this is written, it's inclusive of the ones that were new since last week. Um, I didn't hear any motions in addition to that of things that needed to be added. Okay. Yeah, right. that's correct. So it's all the mo it's all of what was on the slide that Michelle the slides <clears throat> that were walked through. Okay. All right. So I move to approve the one care Vermont fiscal year 24 budget as modified today by the GMCB and subject to the conditions presented today by GMCB staff. Did Robin already second? If not, oh, I, I think second. I second. I second. Yeah. All right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Yeah. Aye. Aye. And the motion carries. Is there any old business to come before the board? Any new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. Then I'll second. take Robin as a <laughs> all right. All kinds of movement to get. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And um. Marissa, Michelle, and Russ, and Matt, and the teams, thank you. This is never easy, and thank you for a lot of really, really, really helpful analysis. Last second questions, all kinds of information. You guys did a really great job, as always, so thank you very much for helping us work through this naughty and difficult issue, um, and have a really nice holiday, everybody. Thank you.